Good morning, everybody. It's an honor to be here and to conduct this two-week course on ocean governance and interdisciplinary research focused focus on the ocean. So it's a very exciting team and a very uh, important uh, discussion that should be done regarding the oceans. Uh, we have now the uh, opening uh, ceremony, and I would like to invite our distinguished colleagues to take, take seat in the, in the stage so that we, we will have the opportunity to, to have their impressions, their uh, reasonings about this, this initiative that we will talk a little bit more um, to you in a few seconds. So I would like to invite Professor Paulo Saldiva to join us. Professor Paulo Saldiva is the director of the Institute of Advanced Studies of University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I would like to invite Sir Salvatore Arico. Uh, Salvatore is the head of the Ocean Science Section at the International Oceanographic Commission, IOC, of UNESCO in Paris, France. I would like to invite Sir Marcos Regis da Silva. Marcos is the executive director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, IAI. I would like to invite Professor Hernan Shaimovic. Professor Hernan Shaimovic is a professor in USP, but now he is uh, representing FAPESP as uh, the special program and collaborator and collaboration in research uh, representative. So Hernan Shaimovic. And I would like to invite Professor, professor Elizabeth Saraiva. She is director of the Oceanographic Institute of University of Sao Paulo. <laughs> My boss. <laughs> well, before uh, 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 let me know that uh, let you know that Pro uh, um, uh, Sir Andrei Polujak from Ministry of Science, Technology. Uh, innovation and communication is arriving. When he arrives, I will invite him to, to join us, okay? So um, this is a, a, a challenge. This course is a challenge, and, but it's also a dream. Uh, when we start to study the oceans, we start to face several difficulties, mostly uh, regarding the connection between different areas of research. And, and, and this should be exercises so that we uh, have the possibility to, to establish new links and new uh, perspectives on how the ocean works and how the ocean affects society and how society affects the ocean. So it's really, really important to focus and to support integrated research, so the, inter the, the, the research that is linked to, to society demands, but also the interdisciplinary research. That's the point we are here, to in uh, have a, the possibility to interact with each, with each other so that we will learn a lot with each other. That's the magic, I hope. <laughs> and then, uh, this course has been uh, supported by a series of institutions. So we have FAPESP as, as, the, as the provider of the funds. Uh, the Research um, Agency of Sao Paulo State is a very important uh, research uh, funding agency in Brazil. Uh, and, and has this kind of, of funding scheme to give support to this kind of course. So FAPESP, uh, is our main partner in terms of, of uh, making this course uh, a reality. And then we have the team that uh, work it to make it real, and make this course real. So the Oceanographic Institute of Sao Paulo University, the uh, Advanced Studies uh, Institute of Sao Paulo University, the Inter-American Institute. Uh, I would like to uh, acknowledge the extremely important support of Professor Tercio Ambrisi from Interdisciplinary Climate Investigation Center, the INCLINE, who gave us all the support in the beginning of, this, this, of the organization of this course, and the Brazilian Network for Monitoring Coastal Benthic Habitats, the REBENTUS. Um, I would also uh, like to acknowledge all the this fantastic team that you know helped us organize this course. The team from IAI, the team from, from EA, the team from EOUSP, all the students that helped us to, to, to be here today. 
So uh, these are my my initial words, and I would like to invite the colleagues to say some some words about the the course and about the the importance of this issue uh, for the society. So, Professor Paulo Saldiva, I would like to start with you, please. Yes, it's good to work to begin with the words in order to make people use it to tragedy and challenges. Um, uh, my name is Paulo Saldiva, I am a physician and I'm presently director of the Institute of Advanced Studies. And this institute is aimed to study trans and multidisciplinary things and I think the ocean is a very good representative of, su of such category of things. By having uh, ocean uh, is source of food, weather control, climate control, money, uh, cultural aspects. Is so having so many interests, it's almost impossible to reach a common agenda because there are represent sectors that would like to use oceans. Uh, let's say for profit, order for maintenance. So it's very difficult to have a common agenda for all. But this is quite common in complex systems. And so you have to take decisions based on science and also in the, what is the action that is good for the majority of us that live in our planet. So this is based on principles. And so information is not uh, sufficient, it's necessary, but you have to take principles into consideration. Let me explain by myself. I, I have a bad right knee. I ha when I will step down this stair, I will receive information from different systems, from the tendons, the muscles, from the sight, the cerebellum, in order to avoid me to fall. If I start to fall, the message will be save the knee. However, if I have a baby on my arm, the decision will be save the baby. If I want to do an agreement between the knee and the baby, probably you'll lose both. And if the lobby of the knee is better, more equipped than that the baby, I will kill the baby. And I suspect that you are killing the baby in the world nowadays. So this not only a matter of information based on physical or, or, or objective data, but also in principles, what we should do in the future. So the ocean links humanities and hard science beautifully. Also, uh, we have oceans, the air, the land are commons, as knowledge it is. Commons are different than commodities. Commodity, you sell something and change this, this object by, and, and receive other, usually money. Knowledge, don't. You share. The people take the knowledge <laughs> and keep it as it originally was. So this is a new economy. The economy, the economy is not prepared to deal with commons. They do much better with commodities. So we have extremely important ways of economy that should be rephrased or rebuilt in order to accommodate the different interests in ocean. I, so uh, this is my message. So this is the reason that this is, uh, when I, I, I received the idea of this meeting, it was love at the first sight. Uh, I uh, supported the very uh, so consider this as an honor of having you here. I hope you like the meeting. I ha I hope you enjoy São Paulo. São Paulo is a beautiful is not a beautiful city. It's it's ugly, but has personality. <laughs> so so you have to understand the city before you decide if you like it or not. Uh, I please uh, feel yourself free to contact my offices uh, just in the other side of this corridor if you need anything from any aspect and I sincerely would like to thank you very much 
to enlighten and to provide the, pre the, the gift of your presence at this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Saldiva. Uh, before giving the, the words to Professor Elizabeth Braga, I would like to acknowledge all the professors that came here to engage with us in this challenge in this course. Uh, so thank you very much for the effort, for the availability to be here and share your, no your knowledge. Okay, Professor Elizabeth. Good morning, member of board, authorities, and participants. I would like to thank uh, the organi organizing committee for the invitation to the opening of this important event. Uh, Sao Paulo School of Advanced Science on Ocean Interdisciplinary Research and Governance, with the presence of highlighted personality, as Professor Paulo Saldiva, Sir Marcos Regis da Silva, Executive Director of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, Professor Herman Chaimovic, Adjunct Panel of Special Programs and Collaboration in Research of FAPESP, and uh, the General uh, Coordination for the Ocean Antarctic of Science that will be here, uh, I think, Andrei Polejak, and the head of the Ocean Science Section at the Intergovernmental uh, Oceanographic Commission uh, of UNESCO, uh, Sir Salvatore Arico. It's an honor for me, as Director of Institute of Oceanographic, um, to be here today participating of the starting of this important event in a moment that the world are facing some problems from economic, political, and social and environmental origin. The environmental problems some, sometimes uh, are results from the conflict between the use of natural resources and the preservation actions without roles. The oceans are subjects of study of different domains of science. It is a moment or, of reflection of how integrated the knowledge centered in, in the oceans to, uh, to form an adequate scenarios to apply sustainability uh, or sustainable actions and uh, how make it of this a component of a terrestrial balance considering the abiotic and the biotic and the social aspects. We observe that the diversity of science domains linked to environmental studies has contributed to a fragmented, fragmented studies as a zoom on a fraction of the problem. The necessity to establish a plan of sustainable actions and governance needs integrated studies, which must be encouraged, mainly involving environmental and social science. At this moment, the contribution coming from the integrate and the inter- and multidisciplinary studies of the ocean is feasible and so welcome. Sao Paulo University with the Oceanographic Institute, Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research, Institute of Advanced Studies and FAPESP are living an opportunity to catalyze and to support a group of experts and students around the ocean thematic, including from its natural role to anthropogenic relations and interventions, passing by oceanographic processes, sustainability and governance to avoid the environmental stress and promoting the dialogue between them. This is a privilege. The merit of Professor Tura, Tura from YOSP is recognized by excellent proposal and organization of this event. 
with collaborators, as Marco Regis da Silva and others, from important institutions. I also, I also recognize that some YOSP students participating in the organization. And uh, I take this opportunity to thank the participation of researchers from the other partner university in this event. I would like to evidence that FAPESP play an important role in the support of the national research progress, as the example offered by the Sao Paulo Advanced School, uh, in a special uh, program represented by Professor Erma Shaimovic. Without doubt, it is a noble initiative that became this event possible. We thank the presence of the general coordination, uh, the, the head of the science section of Inter, uh, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of uh, UNESCO, Sir Salvatore Arica. Uh, this, pres this representation confirmed the importance of, uh, the importance to construct the, an integrated panel of ocean scenarios for the next years, encouraging the scientific technical and innovative development in national and international levels. This cooperative action, São Paulo School of Advanced in Science on Ocean Interdisciplinary Research and Governance, favored the presence of so important person, researchers, and students coming from other regions of Brazil and from some countries I saw 21 representation of countries here. Uh, all then united in the, in the proposal to move the integrated knowledge about the oceans and its multidisciplinarity, thinking in a better world. If you have a time, I will, be, I will have a pleasure to receive you at the Oceanography Institute for a visit during this period. Welcome to Sao Paulo, to University of Sao Paulo and to City of Sao Paulo. Good studies. Thank you, Professor Elizabeth Braga, for your kind words and the uh, importance of this kind of linkage to improve the ocean science. So that's we are, what we are seeking here, we are looking for here. I would like to invite Professor Hernan Shaimovic to share with us your thoughts and words. Thank you. Um, dear members of the uh, opening session, whatever, okay. Um, it, it's a pleasure to be here representing FAPESP, but one thing that, that, well, I have almost half an hour or 40 minutes after this to, yes. to speak, so I'll try to be very brief. Generally, I lie about it. Um, I've been here in this position a number of times because I'm, I'm not as old as the ocean, come on, but I'm quite. And you, you have to feel the honor that you have being in this room. This room is, was uh, a place where the University Council met for a number of years since this building was built until a couple of years ago. So most of the decisions made by the University of Sao Paulo were made here under the leadership of several rectors, and I'm not going to go into the, the story. What I do want to say is that in 1932, uh, this state lost a civil war. And the reaction of the ruling class at the time was quite incredible. They said, let's start a university. This is something very, very strange. Let's start a university for the state of Sao Paulo to be the engine that drives Brazil. This is foresight. 
This is the way that perhaps, who knows, some politicians will save the world by looking at the ocean. See, my generation, I'm very old, my generation using evidence, that is, using science, made very, very important pressures to obtain public policy, international public policy, regarding the oceans. The whale thing, the protected areas thing, a number of things, the sea thing, uh, decisions that protected the ocean a bit, not much. Your generation, for the young people in this course, have a much higher responsibility. First, to obtain evidence. Your responsibility is not the void of the speech without evidence, but to produce evidence for the speech to be very concrete. And to attain in some way, and the UNESCO representative knows very well what I'm saying, that the countries belonging to the international uh, organizations really look at the oceans with evidence-based studies that point to the presumed, I think it's actual, but the presumed danger of a 0.3 pH unit decrease in pH in the ocean in the next 20 years. So your generation has a responsibility that my generation was not aware of. The oceans constitute the buffer that sustain humanity. I mean, there's no CO2 capture possible without the ocean. Oh, okay, trees are good, but if you, if you calculate, uh, things become a bit different. We're losing life, we're losing the chance of living in this planet if the phenomena that are now happening in the ocean don't change course. And this is your responsibility. To produce the science and the crosstalk with society that may save the planet. It's not a small responsibility. But I'm very, very happy that this beautiful initiative made by Papespi, and I'm going to do the propaganda pitch afterwards, okay? <laughs> this beautiful opportunity for exchange of ideas of young scientists with mature scientists with representatives of national and international organizations give rise to personal relationships that maintain the idea that oceans is a worldwide problem and every contribution has to be multidisciplinary and international. So thank you very much for being here and I'm going to go on for about an hour afterwards. Thank you, thank you, Professor Hernan. Um, now I will ask Mr. Marcos Regis da Silva to share your thoughts with us. Thank you. Can you? Is it on? Yeah. It's working. Thank you. Um, you're very fortunate to be here at the University of Sao Paulo. It's not only the best university in Brazil, and with a certain envy that I, I listened to Professor Chamovich because I come from another city in Brazil where our universities are literally falling apart. You know, and, I, and Sao Paulo ranks among the best in the world. It, it's, it's a very, very powerful university. And like he said, it has an ideology and it has an ideology towards sustainable change. 
And for that, I, I congratulate the school. And it couldn't have been better time to have this meeting on oceans, particularly with the negotiations, as you know, on the ocean bed. Um, I have been mostly involved in my work on illegal, unregulated, and unreported fishing, which is a, a, a huge uh, problem. Uh, you look at the disappearance of the uh, Arctic uh, ice bed. I, I mean, we can look at the issue from any number of angles. And the fact that the school emphasizes transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary work, I think allows us to reflect that no one discipline has the solutions to that you're going to face. We can look at this from economics, which I think most, many governments do. We can look at this from oceanography, from biology, from climate change, and so on and so on. But no one discipline will arrive at it. Now, transdisciplinary research is very, very difficult, right? It's not something that uh, a scholar can, can immediately uh, claim to understand. It's a way to take different disciplines and try to arrive at a new methodology to understand the complexity of a problem that at first may appear to be overwhelming. And coupled with this, I think you have also to realize how complex governance issues are, particularly in the international arena. The environment is possibly one of the most complex governance uh, domains that you encounter. And I, I, uh, similar to Professor Chamovich, I'll be speaking on this. And we also have a representative from the United Nations who deals with governance issues. And it's a very opportune moment for you to reflect on your role as a young scientist and the responsibilities that you have in the science to policy transition. Right? You know the science, you know the results, you know the answers, you know, you know, you can more or less assume what's going to happen if option A is taken instead of option B. But why does policy at times seem to diverge from scientific opinion? Why is there a disparagement of science in certain areas of the world at present? Why are certain nations withdrawing from the multilateral process where the multilateral process provides the solutions to deal with problems that no one country can arrive alone? That is why this school is so important. This is why the school provides you the opportunity to reflect on your role and your responsibility. You will be the future leaders. We're retiring possibly pretty soon or dead, you know, one of the two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this is not a traditional school. This is an interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary opportunity for you to question the way things are. And with these very brief words, I'd like to thank the, Ocean the Institute of Oceanography of the University of Sao Paulo. Congratulations, uh, AFAPESP. Uh, none of this would have been possible for AFAPESP. I, I hope they explain a bit the role AFAPESP has in Sao Paulo in, in promoting science. The work it does is unique in Brazil, if not unique in, uh, throughout the world. Uh, Alexandria, I'd like to thank you personally for your work, and also Luciana Xavier uh, for her work as well in organizing this. And I hope we have a very productive two days. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much. So moving from our initial and local uh, thoughts and, and incentives and, and uh, words, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Salvatore Arico to share with us some thoughts and incentives uh, at the world perspective uh, by UNESCO. Please. Thank you, um, Alex, uh, Professor Tura. Uh, for, first of all, uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I, I would like to start by uh, acknowledging the leadership of uh, uh, the university through um, 
the persons of uh, Professor Turra and uh, Professor Braga and also Professor Saldiva. So uh, why leadership? Uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, because uh, uh, it is about uh, taking uh, uh, ocean science out of the science box, trying to link ocean science with uh, society, and also trying to bridge scales. How do you link the local uh, problems and solutions with uh, the kind of uh, uh, multilateral uh, negotiations that uh, Dr. Da Silva was referring to, considering that many of uh, the, the ocean problems that we are faced with uh, require international scientific collaboration and actual negotiations. So, um, so I, I think it's quite courageous and uh, uh, forward-looking to have students like yourselves um, really busy with your uh, studies, coming mostly from conventional ocean science, although I understand several of the, uh, you are also involved in uh, policy implications and applications of ocean science, and, and having this group of wonderful students meet here, uh, which is not only a uh, renowned, uh, world-renowned university, but also university in the south. This is very important because um, the time has come to see some, you know, new players uh, and we already saw those new players on the international scene. And why is that? Because, because uh, one thing is uh, sort of a science in a, in a developed uh, country where you have uh, certain levels of ocean science investments, infrastructures, uh, human resources, uh, uh, scientific publications. Another thing can be science in a country with uh, uh, an economy in transition or in the developing world. So I think it's a very important reality check. Then uh, I also like the challenge, uh, which partly falls of me, on, on me to uh, trying to convey, share with you this um, experience essentially uh, of mine for the past 25 years uh, uh, by now with the UN uh, on uh, what ocean science and science in general is in an intergovernmental context uh, in, the, in the context of the UN versus uh, uh, ocean science in a purely academic context. It's still ocean science, but it's like the other side of the face it. And uh, I would like to try and contribute later during the panel to demonstrating or illustrating to you this continuum between the science and, and the policy. Uh, all of that to say that uh, I'm afraid I, I do agree with uh, the representative of, of FAPESP and also uh, with uh, the other speakers that uh, it very much uh, falls on, on you the responsibility to deal with uh, several of, the, of those uh, uh, not only unresolved issues like IUU, but also emerging issues. Uh, we, uh, we keep facing uh, new challenges. Uh, who would have said 10, 15 years ago that uh, plastics in the ocean would have uh, uh, become so important? But of course, it's a privilege as well uh, to uh, be part of uh, the next generation of ocean scientists at the service of society and I'm very much convinced that this school will help you get there. Thank you. Thank you, Salvatore. Uh, it's, it's important to, to understand that working with the oceans uh, allows us to work from the, the tide pool behind that rock in that beach, but to put this in a world context. So even if you, if you are doing a master thesis in a very specific team, it's important to look, to understand where you are targeting in terms of this global agenda. And the oceans are now in the global agenda. Uh, we have, I think, uh, Salvatore will talk about you uh, on the decade of the oceans. In the, in the panel, which is a very, very strong strategy to push, to launch the oceans in a new 
and bigger perspective. So I think we are in a momentum that uh, we need, don't have the opportunity to lose. So that's, that's, the, that's why I think this kind of, of initiative uh, is a changing, has a power to change a lot of things. So thank you very much for, for your, your words, your thoughts, your incentive, and I think we will have a very, very productive uh, course. Thank you. So we now have a, a very brief uh, speech. Uh, this is an interdisciplinary course, but it's a multinational course. We have 23 countries here. And this means that we need to make a very big effort to understand, but also to be understood. So speak slowly, ask if you don't understand. Sometimes we use words that doesn't exist in English. <laughs> I know, I know. But that's the creativity, so feel free, relax, enjoy, <laughs> okay? We are all friends in the end, everything will be all right. Okay, so the oceans. Huh? We have several views of the oceans. Each of you uh, has a special relationship with one of these things. Uh, so the oceans mean several things, or different things for different people. Yeah? And for most of the humanity, the oceans doesn't mean anything because they, they, doesn't know, they don't know the oceans, the importance of the oceans and what's going on with the oceans. That's why ocean literacy is a very important team issue that needs to be fostered. And this kind of initiative helps us to reinforce that. So oceans are important. Oceans are endangered. Society, uh, based on Aristotelic logic, is endangered. Okay? Oceans are in the international agenda. Since uh, Hill 92, oceans started to have a very specific and uh, evident uh, space in, the, in these documents, in the international decisions. So if you see here, we have the... Uh, the regular process of the United Nations to assess the quality of the oceans, including, it's interesting because there is a comma, including socioeconomic aspects. Well, that's why we are here. We are trying to include everything, eh? to think widely, holistically. And then the regular process is led by um, UN General Assembly, so that you can see the importance of this process. Uh, with the support of IOC, with, uh, of UNEP, and several other organizations. Since 92, the agenda, uh, the ocean agenda increased uh, or became more important or more clear in the international agenda. So that we had the SDGs, the uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we have a specific one related to the oceans, the number 14. But if you, if you look in detail, in more detail, you can see that the oceans are in all, sev all the 17 goals, more directly or indirectly. So the oceans are really, really important. Last year, we had the ocean conference, the UN ocean conference, with the volunteer commitments. And we had more than 1,400 1, volunteer commitments from uh, NGOs, from governments, from international organizations committing them, themselves to do something. Yeah? Something that they could do. Brazil uh, submitted several uh, commitments. And this, this is really important because this makes people that not necessarily are linked to a given uh, international or national uh, uh, organization to uh, share their efforts to preserve, to conserve, and to use the oceans in a sustainable way. And then we have uh, the decade, the decade of the oceans, of the science for the oceans that I think Salvatore will uh, share with you a little bit more. So the oceans are in this spot. Okay? These are the SDGs, and that, uh, that's what I, I, I talked to you. So we are seeing that the oceans have, uh, bring us the opportunity to link different aspects, the economic, the social, the environmental, 
the oceans help us to link all the other objectives. Because if you talk about no hunger, no poverty, we need to consider the oceans. Huh? Climate regulation, so uh, it's, it's really, really a key aspect. So we uh, are focusing on the sustainable development goal 14 here, so that we, we need to think how to get there, how to conserve, how to use in a sustainable way the oceans, how to find ways to use, to produce money in a wise way using the oceans, in the oceans, what is being called by uh, uh, the, the, the blue growth, uh, so several countries are, are trying to to figure out how to instant, uh, to support that in their in their uh, scientific community. So it's really important that we turn our heads, our thoughts, to focus on different aspects related to the oceans. Not only measuring things, understanding how it works, but to how to use it. How are the impacts? How how can we integrate all these caveats? So our goal here is to provide graduate students with advanced knowledge on interdisciplinary ocean research and integrated science and governance, including issues related to public policy. That's why we have a panel today uh, where we have, we have the opportunity to, to see um, decision makers people that are engaged with decisions related to science or related to the oceans or related to the science to the oceans. And then we will see how difficult sometimes uh, implementing policies are or even creating these policies. So this will be very important. So our expectation is that participants will discuss relevant themes with renowned scientists in a multidisciplinary and multicultural context. The main themes are, we have uh, three slots. So in the beginning, we will set the context. We will discuss theoretical and historical background related to the oceans, to governance. And then we will move to a more oceanographic, social oceanographic. It, sometimes this is a, a kind of erratic uh, word, no? the social oceanographic human ecology, human oceanography, this is a mess sometimes, but that's what we want to focus, link different things. So we are talking about processes and connections, both within oceanographic science and among oceanographic sciences and others. And then in the end, we will, we will exercise the planning. So using all this information to plan uh, how to link your reality, your projects, to the big world, to the big scene, OK? We have a uh, schedule. This is a relatively uh, sketched schedule. The opening day, we have a little opening a session panel. We have class one after lunch. Uh, we will have a book launching, book launching today on stories on a benthic perspective, Brazilian stories on a benthic perspective, in the end, before a reception with Chorinho. If you don't know what Chorinho means, the literal translation is a small cry. <laughs> but it's not that. <laughs> Almost there. But uh, it's a very, very interesting and, and fantastic song we have here in Brazil. I don't know if we have Chorinho in other places, but it's very good. You, you know that. Uh, and then the regular days, we have several regular days, okay? And then we have classes in the morning, in the afternoon, and we have tutoring or poster sessions where, where we, you will be able to interact with the professors, okay? Uh, and uh, more, more in the, the end of the course, we, we have this uh, interdisciplinary exercise in a Saturday, okay? And then we have a few trip to Santos. You'll be uh, able to see some very interesting, but not uh, good things like uh, informal uh, um, uh, livelihoods, people living in 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 places that they they couldn't live, né? without infrastructure, with uh, difficulties and, and difficult conditions. 
to live there. And we will see some problems related to erosion, building in a uh, not very strong soil, né? so that you can see buildings like this. So né? you cannot play marbles inside the, the building. It's a complicated. And then we will discuss a lot of problems that occur here in Brazil, but also in other countries. So that, uh, that will be a very interesting exercise. Uh, and then we will have uh, this field trip, and then uh, in the end we will discuss um, the interaction of your projects with the big, the, this big agenda. So this is some drawings. And then we have the invited speakers. We have uh, speakers from several countries, of obviously uh, almost half of them from Brazil, because that was the the request from, from FAPESP, we had to have a balance between uh, local and foreign um, uh, professors. And that's, for me, this is the most interesting uh, result of this, of this course. We have 23 countries represented, represented here, including Brazil. And you can see, Salvatore, the South, the South link, link Andre, the South Link seems to be very well represented here. Obviously, the North-South relationship is there, but the South, the South to South uh, relationship is being somehow improved. Yeah, with representatives from South America, from Africa, from from Asia, from Oceania, and other sites. Okay, so this is really, really amazing. And then I would like to. Now, formally, again, <laughs> um, uh, acknowledge uh, the organizers. So, Marcela and Marcos from IAI and Sandra here, here, not here, over there. Sandra um, uh, doing all the efforts here in uh, Institute of Advanced Studies to make this, this uh, course happen. So, thank you very much. I would like applause to our colleagues. And this team, this is a fantastic, amazing team from IAI. So Mariana, the first one, and the other ones from Institute, uh, Oceanographic Institute. They are um, graduate students, postdocs, that, are, that work very, very hard in the next three months, four months, to make it happen. Uh, Marcela uh, may... Uh, agree with me that this team was very, very, very uh, successful and, and uh, I don't know how to say that, but well, fantastic. Okay, so <laughs> applause. So. so their engagement makes this this happen the way you are seeing. Okay, and that's that. Okay, so uh, this was a, a brief introduction. I would like to share some figures and these maps with you because they are really, really important, really amazing, uh, this capture of the international representation of the, the countries here in the course. So now we have, since the coffee is not there yet, we have uh, two talks. Uh, the first one is from Fapespi, Professor Erna, and the second one from Marcus from uh, IAI to share with uh, with us some of the funding opportunities uh, that we can apply to strengthen the links between countries, so that we can also uh, have the the interest to, to if you have the interest to come to Brazil, uh, there are some possible uh, uh, calls that may uh, that you may apply. If, uh, I will leave you with Professor Erna and then with Marcos in the sequence. Okay, Professor, please. Well, it is, something will happen, okay? So, um, I'm Hernan Chaimovic. I'm an emeritus professor of chemistry. I still teach and have a small research group. But at the same time, <clears throat> I'm an advisor to the scientific director of PAPESPI, and uh, I'm, I'm supposed to, to tell you about things, so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, Brazil is a large country. It's about uh, 210 million people. 
Those are numbers from 2016. And we occupy a large, a rather large area. And of course, we have access to an enormous quantity of water on, the, on your right side. We are in the state of Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo state is a large populated state, about 45 million people. Our GDP, the state GDP, is about 34% of the GDP of the country. However, we produce about 50% of the total science output of the country. And in a sense, this is because a large percentage of the state budget is dedicated to higher education, research, and development. So if you look at our budget, 1.6% of the budget goes to research and development. Why is this possible? Simple things. We have large state-funded universities. We have a small number of federal institutions. We have an enormous number of very successful technical faculties. About 45% of the PhDs graduated in Brazil come from the state of Sao Paulo. We have a large number of research institutes and about more than 62, this, is, this number is outdated for about a year, um, uh, more than 60% of all money invested in research and development comes from the state, not from the federal government. So I'm going to try desperately to cover these three themes in half an hour, four. So we are speaking about 75,000 researchers in the state of Sao Paulo, more than half in higher education, 30,000 in companies, and about 3,000 in other places. Our expenditures a year, uh, two years ago, uh, correspond to about $15 billion in PPP money, uh, about 60% in companies, 3.4 billion or about 33% by the state government, and about 17% of the federal government. You have to realize that these numbers are quite different from the scenery in Brazil. Uh, just to give you a feeling for that, these are the numbers of what is the percentage of investment in research and development with state funds. Sao Paulo is in the bottom. It's 10 times larger than Rio de Janeiro, which is another state and 25 times larger than Minas Gerais, which is another state. This is a political decision. It doesn't depend on the amount of money that the state creates, because in no case the budget of Sao Paulo is 25 times higher than any other state in, in the Union. But this is a political decision, as I mentioned before. In terms of international comparisons, you can read much faster than I, than I can talk. So take a look. Uh, we graduate a lot of PhDs a year. You can see the comparison of Brazil, South Korea, Japan, and the UK. And Sao Paulo is responsible, has been responsible for 50% of the scientific production of Brazil for a long time. And we produce about, Brazil produces about 3% of the world indexed papers. And this state creates more science if we can equate science with publications is, is a complicated equation, but anyway, we create more science than any country in Latin America. 
So one of the reasons, one of the reasons that this is like, as I described, is because FAPESPI, which is the state of Sao Paulo foundation to support research in any area. And when I say any area, I mean from high energy physics to philosophy. So any area of knowledge is important to us. So we have one mission. And when a large organization has only one mission, things are simple and clear. Our mission is to support research in all fields. That's our mission. It's simple. Simpler said than done, but anyway. <laughs> It's funded by the state of Sao Paulo with 1% of all state revenues. So we don't have to discuss with, the, with Congress or anybody else every year. It's 1% of whatever comes in. All proposals are peer reviewed. And that means that the proposal for this school was peer reviewed and it competed with other proposals and this was successful and I can see by the faces in the audience, the young faces, that the success is essentially guaranteed. Uh, we take about two months to decide uh, and, and you must remember that as one advisor of mine said, their lies, their damned lies, and their statistics, okay? So uh, we take, in average, two months. Sometimes it takes more, sometimes it takes less. That's our annual budget, is about 500 something million dollars in 2016. And we support a number of fellowships uh, of different types, postdocs, PhDs, masters, undergrads, and both in Brazil and abroad. And when, when we say we support research, we use three uh, different tools, a two-year tool, a five-year tool, and a 10-year tool. And it depends on the ambition of the project. It depends on the necessity. It depends on many things. And for anything, we peer review and we employ one of the tools. Now, when we are speaking of 11-year financing, we're speaking of research centers, whether totally financed by FAPESPI, or finance in partnership with companies, with other states, or even at times with the federal government. And we have a very, very strong program to support research in small and medium businesses. So though, though that's the breakout of the research projects. Uh, we have application-driven research fundamental research, we invest in infrastructure, and you can take a look at all the data, and I have to run, or else professor will sort of raise a flag and say, come on. Uh, so that's our investment. We invest about 30, this year has, this number has decreased a bit, about 40% in fellowships, 34% in regular grants, and 26% in what we define as research programs. So that's the detail. I'll tell you at the end where to get all this data, okay? Now this is important for us. We support research of different kinds, because in the world, and in Brazil, there is a totally utilitarian view about science, which is perfect, and it has to be supported. Science that makes people happier, science that makes business more competitive, 
science that heals the sick, science that makes the poor rich. But in addition, for us in Papespi, it's extremely important to support science that makes mankind wiser. In all fields, there are problems that are important to humanity, in philosophy, in archaeology, in astronomy, and that's fundamental science. And for us, there has to be an equilibrium between investment in utilitarian science and fundamental science. And for us, we don't measure results. We measure impact. What does that mean? It means that we have to measure each time we invest in intellectual impact. And, and it's all ideas because we support research. And research is idea creation. Idea that produce new ideas. Ideas that make humanity wiser. Ideas that help to form generations like you guys or girls that produce new ideas. But we also need social impact, ideas that affect public policies, ideas that reduce inequality, ideas that increase social involvement with science. And we are also after economic impact. That is, we have to create, using science, new companies and generate jobs. We have to increase the competitiveness of companies and generate jobs. We have to create ideas that create totally new industrial sectors. And if you look at what is the result of our investment, this is just a small sample of papers published over the last two or three years that appeared in covers of rather important magazines of science in the world. We can show, for example, that our investment in research has generated a number of companies. These are just numbers from one of the state universities. These companies in 2016 generated three billion in revenues. And of course, our programs go to this type of investment, this type of investment. To your left, you see one research project that calculated what happens with water when a plane lands in a flooded airfield. And to the right, you see the plane, OK? So economic impact safety and we have funded important university engineering research centers the description is in the slide one two three four everybody read it and we maintain that for us is absolutely essential to maintain a very solid international research collaboration. What's our vision? To make the state of Sao Paulo a recognized international research hub. Collaboration is always two ways. Researchers come and go, but FAPESPI is not a travel agency. FAPESPI is an agency that supports research. And collaboration certainly extends over mobility. The type of collaboration is normal in the world. We have co-financing agreements with agencies, with universities, and all our programs involve help for the Brazilian researchers to grow abroad and for international researchers to come to Brazil. If you look at our investment, 
This is what has happened with investment in international collaboration over the years. This is the value awarded to grants with international research collaboration. Everybody can see that it's growing like mad, okay? And we collaborate all over the world. Uh, there was an enormous vacuum in Russia until this year. We signed a very strong agreement with Russia, with a Russian research agency, but we have collaborations in all continents. And the number of articles published by Sao Paulo authors with international co-authors has increased. So we are reaching 40, 50%. And you must remember that, not remember, you must realize that if you look at Europe, some major universities, when they publish from the university, 80% involves authors from other countries. So 40% is not bad. And uh, most frequent co-authors come from the States, UK, Spain, Germany, and France. But 20 years ago, almost 20 years ago, I published a paper in Sandometrics showing that if a Sao Paulo researcher collaborates with the US or with Chile, the increase in scientific impact increases the same thing. So researchers collaborating south-south, if they're both good, and that's the important part of it, and we know how to evaluate that, uh, when you use scientists from different cultures, the results never sum. They always multiply. And how do we know that this thing is working? We know that this thing is working because the research impact of the science published with international collaboration is shooting up. So we have research projects with international collaborations of different types. And we have enormous opportunities, not only for Brazilians, but for young foreign scientists to come to Sao Paulo. One is postdoctoral fellowships. And you can see that we have at least 1,000 in 2013. I, I couldn't find the slide from this year, but it's, it multiplied, it increased about 40%. And we have a very, very interesting and different mechanism, which is the Young Investigator Award. We never ask for passport for this award. This award is always announced internationally, and it involves grants for at least four years, and we have 1,400 awards since 96. And that implies a scholarship, which is a reasonable amount of money, and money for research. That is, we know and we want the young investigator to be independent, to create a new research line, either alone or associated with another research group. That is the description of the young investigators hired to begin their scientific careers in the state of Sao Paulo. Very few in the human and social sciences, but some. We want to bring foreign scientists to Sao Paulo. And one of the examples we're joining today. 
this is one of the mechanisms to let the signs in Sao Paulo be known all over the world. But there are different mechanisms. And when you look at the oceans, those are the words that are in the research grants that are currently funded by Vapespi. You can, you can all see that, okay? Uh, it's different words, climate, Atlantic, biodiversity, variability, ecotoxicology, and, and, and small words that you can't see very well because they correspond to less research projects financed by the foundation. And this is another contribution of Apespi to oceanography. This is a large scientific oceanic vessel that was acquired for this university by Papespi about six years ago. So we have a vessel. And you can find information about research in Sao Paulo in our newsletter, which is in English. And this is an important message because we have a virtual library in FAPESPI, it's BB FAPESPI, it's in English, and we have a very strong research and search engine that you can find names, themes, money, opportunities, grants, calls, whatever you want to know about. Thank you. I'll, I'll stand up because I get very nervous when speaking, so I'd rather just move around and fidgeting in my seat. Um, I was, I'll be speaking to you as a member of an international regional organization and as an international civil servant. It's very different from a scientist or a private citizen or, or even a government official. Uh, basically, I don't have an opinion. I, I work for governments. But, and yet, in the background, um, I am privy to a number of discussions, a number of processes that allow the multilateral world, meaning countries that join as a group, to move forward on an issue. And I can tell you, it's absolutely fascinating how it functions. And perhaps on this talk, I can give you a taste of how the system functions what an international organization does, why decisions are what they are, how that process is achieved, and what your role could be in this world, because this is where decisions are made. This is where the multilateral international agenda is decided. can't make this go down. Ah, there you go. The Inter-American the Inter Institute for Global Change Research, it's a regional intergovernmental organization. And this is very important. We're not a non-governmental organization. Right? We're not prescriptive. We don't tell countries what to do. It would be highly inappropriate for the II or me as an international civil servant to tell a government what to do. The governments are my boss. And actually, a few of my directors are sitting around the table, so I have to be particularly careful what I say. And as you see, most of the Americas are members. This is a regional organization. We concern ourselves only with American countries. Very few are non-members, mostly in the Caribbean 
in a few Central American countries. The core value is scientific excellence, international cooperation, and full and open exchange of scientific information. And I'll come back to this over and over and over again. It's an intergovernmental instrument where scientists and decision makers jointly address problems. It is a science to policy interface. And this is extremely important because of the older overriding importance that science now has in policymaking. We've always had science in policymaking. You think of agriculture. Agricultural research is, is big. Health research is big. But the type of science that we're speaking about now, trying to influence policy, is relatively new. Climate change. It doesn't go back 70, 100 years. And the priorities, the priorities are decided at a number of levels. And first comes the national. The national level is important. This is where national priorities are decided. What is the national priority for Brazil? What are the national priorities for Brazil? The countries then get together and they decide within a regional context. What are, how do the national priorities affect decisions at a regional level? And from that regional level, it goes to an international level. And the international level is structured through a number of governance frameworks. Among these, I mean, most of you have discussed the sustainable development uh, goals, right? It's, it's driving the agenda right now. You have the UN strategic plan for biodiversity and its AHE targets. There's an entire discussion of the post-2020 biodiversity agenda. The Paris Agreement and a number of other frameworks. So how does a national priority within a regional context influence the decision making at a higher level. And how and what's the role of a regional organization within this context that answers to 19 different governments? I think I'm going very fast. Well, how did I manage to do this? Now, what's the traditional model within decision making? Well, let's say there's a problem. Transboundary pollution, transboundary air pollution. Transgenetic flow, ocean mining. All of a sudden, the countries realize that these problems can't be solved individually. One single nation can't solve the problem. So they get together and they decide within a certain instrument. Think of the Minamata Convention that was adopted very, very recently on Mercury, for example. Now, most of these bodies have scientific sub bodies, a substa, a subsidiary body on technical, technical advice, for example. This body, so the countries identify a problem and solutions have to come from a regional and international perspective because a country can't solve it alone. The scientific bodies, well, they get together and they examine an issue that the governments that set up this instrument requested them to examine. That's what UNFCCC is. It's climate change, because that whole convention was adopted by governments. And they make, rec they make scientific recommendations. Now, the scientific, this is supposed to be based on science. And theoretically, right, theoretically, these are supposed to be devoid of political considerations. But then the recommendations go to what's called a conference of the parties, which is an agglomeration of all the governments that have joined this instrument. And this is where policy comes about. So this is where policy sometimes doesn't match the scientific decision-making because you have to be sensitive to the number 
of different factors that a government must deal with. How does a poor country explain that they have to remain poor and they can't industrialize and pollute, whereas the rich countries can remain rich and they already have the money to stop polluting? It's, 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 it's a simplification, right? It's, it's a very simple type of government. But you can understand the complexities that come from national priorities, regional context, to an international decision making. Now, this environment is fragmented. And I'll, I'll try to be as diplomatic as possible. It is an absolute mess. There are over 900 multilateral and over 1,500 bilateral environmental agreements or treaties. And some people say that this overwhelming number of treaties have become almost unenforceable. Countries are having tremendous problems in dealing with these different issues. And this is just environment. I put the citation here if you want to read into this. But what's the result when you have so many hundreds of environmental treaties? Well, you have different ministries responding to different treaties. You have different decision-making under different treaties. You could have contradictory decisions. Even within the same country, you could have one department going to one treaty and another department going to another treaty and having that type of conflict, a national conflict in that decision-making. I'll give you an example. I come from the biodiversity world. The Convention on International Trade on Endangered Species, which also regulates a number of marine species, sharks, a number of shark species, for example, can recommend a total ban on trade without any regard to indigenous issues. Now, indigenous issues, as you know, is high on the agenda in the UN. And parties have a number of obligations that have agreed to under other treaties. And yet, a decision from CITES can devastate an indigenous community. Now, I just saw this article the other day, and it caught me out my eye. The CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, is the framework convention for biodiversity. And the authors claim CBD limits biodiversity research when the cure kills. What are they talking about? Now, <laughs> CBD is the framework for biodiversity. It's where the major global decisions on sustainable use, conservation, and access to and benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources comes from. But not only that, it, I, I forget the number of authors to the article. I think there's something like 10 authors. There were 170 co-signatories supporting the article from different parts of the world. These are major scientists, right? These aren't lightweights, of which 71 are from the Americas, many of which are from Brazil and Argentina. So all of a sudden, you have a, scient a, a scientific community complaining about a major international policy-making body that which almost all countries adhere to. I think only the Vatican and the United States are not members of the CBD. Now, that article refers to the Nagoya Protocol on Access and Benefit Sharing. Yeah. Um, that's the uh, protocol that deals with re genetic resources. So to access and take out of a country a genetic resource has become a rather complicated affair. You have legislation that is being made. You need a certificate of compliance to be able to bring, to export that genetic resource, and so on and so on. Now, what caught my eye in that paper is the claim that different countries have established different regulatory frameworks to access genetic resources. Some are extremely restrictive, others so-and-so, and others not at all. 
But their claim, the researchers claim, which is backed by the scientific community, including the Latin American scientific community, is that the problem is particularly acute where there is a poor policy science interface resulting from weak scientific institutions. And I think to you, this should ring a number of bells because this reflects the need for scientists to be involved in the science to policy interface. Your work counts. Now, I, would, I am more familiar with the Americas, and I would argue within this incredibly fragmented environment, environmental environment, the Americas has been particularly successful. And it's curious. As a negotiating region, the Americas has some very, very good international negotiators. I've seen them go toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the very powerful regions in the world. GRULAC, that's the group of Latin American and Caribbean countries, is an extremely effective negotiating block in multilateral environmental agreements. And such homogeneity of action provides many opportunities. It's one of the reasons the European Union is so effective. They negotiate as a block in many issues. Now, the IEI as a regional organization is very much reflective of the desire of American countries to establish a collaborative mechanism to provide policymakers with the best scientific information for decision making. And again, I, I want to be particularly clear that the IEI is not prescriptive. When it presents the results of its research, it is not saying, do this. It gives options. This is what, this is what may happen given A, B, C, and this. This is what may happen given A, B, C, and this. Our, research, our research suggests A, B, C, and D, and the policymaker should make an informed decision. Given the number of variables that will impact on that decision. And from a regional organization's perspective, there's also the recognition that no one organization can achieve its objectives alone. You need partnerships. The IEI has to work with partners. Even a regional organization is insufficient to arrive at the type of knowledge that policymakers need. That's why we work with UNESCO, UNFCCC, SUBSTA, and so on and so on. We try to integrate our scientific community into understanding the policy processes that arrive at decisions that will very much impact on our survival. IPES, IPCC, the Intergovernmental Platform on Climate Change. It's an extremely important instrument. And we encourage our scientific community very much to become involved in the decision-making. Self-sustaining networks. You work best when you're part of a network. You do not work in isolation. Knowledge is generated through networks. And one of the reasons I would argue the IEI is so supportive of the school is precisely because it has been exceptionally successful in allowing you to enter these networks. Part of this school is to provide you access into what could be a very restrictive network. But once you're a member, that knowledge is there for the taking. And also, the support of open science and data. I cannot, I, can, I cannot emphasize to you how important it is the whole ideal of open data is. Data makes much more sense when it is holistic, integrated, and accessible. Science is based, I mean, after all, what is science? 
It's the quantification of observational phenomena. We quantify things, we measure. And if you don't have those measurements, it doesn't move forward. So I just want to op use open science as an example because science is not as controversial as many other topics. Genetic resources, you know, seabed mining, indigenous rights. Open data is very clear cut. But just to give you an idea of how the multilateral world works, sustainable development goals, paragraph 83. Right? It talks on the role of information in science policy. A strong push for open access. The UN plan for biodiversity, paragraph six, insufficient scientific information for policy and decision making. There's always a push for decision making. Article 17 of the CBD, it has an entire article on information exchange, on the need to share knowledge. Something very important to a region. There has been agreement on a regional agreement to, on access to information, participation, and justice in environmental matters in Latin America and the Caribbean. Just adopt it. And it will be open for signature on 27th of September coming. So it comes into force as an agreement under the United Nations. So countries have an obligation to provide this data. The Rio Declaration, UNFCC, the full, open, and prompt exchange of relevant scientific, technological, technical, social, economic, and legal information, right? On and on and on. But if we get to the sea, we also have under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, that I could get other conventions, other instruments regarding the sea. There's Article uh, 200 and many, many articles on information. So this provides the governance context for data and information at a multilateral world where countries that are members, that are participants, signatories, that have ratified those agreements should respect. Right? So if a country does not want to make its information available, you could say, hey, hey you, know, you signed the CBD, you signed this, you signed the uh, law of the sea, and so on and so on. But that is still a sovereign decision. And as you know, international law is very difficult to enforce. And again, I think this is where the scientific community should make its voice known, just as it made its voice known through that science article. So, the II functions in this fragmented ecosystems by trying to understand, working with, uh, with its parties, what are the national priorities? What does a single government consider as a priority? And then this has to be placed within a structure of a regional and international frameworks. And we do not do science for science's sake. If we did, my recommendation would be, hey, just give the money to you. You don't need to go through a a bureaucratic uh, governance structure agreed by the parties to decide what science is made. The science is decided by the governments because they need the results from that science to make decisions in response to certain obligations they may have, whether it is within a decision, a sovereign decision at a national level, or rather it's respecting an obligation at an international level. So I want to speak of one of our programs, which is the Collaborative Research Networks. It's a funding program for science. It's now in its third iteration. And I, I believe it's a clear manifestation by American countries to support a joint, mutually beneficial approach to science, but more important, to use the results for that science for policymaking. We do not do science for science's sake. We do science to inform policymakers. And that policy decision is a sovereign decision. Two types of projects, very large, up to a million, perhaps much more if there's co-funding. 
and that resulted for the initial call for proposals on ecosystem services and seven smaller projects. These are seed projects trying to get a spark going that perhaps can be developed into a bigger project. And we have a number of other projects parallel to the CRNs. For example, we just submitted a proposal to the um, United Nations office on South-South on megacities, right? uh, South America, perhaps Central America as well. It's one of the most urbanized places in the world. And mega cities are an incredible challenge at the moment. This is uh, interesting. I don't know if you can read it, but um, it's a declaration from the Senate of Argentina recognizing the value of one of the projects on oceans. And I'll, I'll try to um, translate this and blah, 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 the name of the project, Vosses, uh, variability of the ocean ecosystems uh, in South America, in southern South America, and uh, for its contribution to the improvement of the information for the evaluation of the impact on climatic, natural variability, and anthropogenic in the large marine ecosystems of Pentagonia, Humboldt, and southern Brazil, from the center of Argentina recognizing the worth of a CRN3 project. And to me, this is, a, again, a clear manifestation of a science to policy interface. We are not telling Argentina what to do, but Argentina is able to use the results generated from a regional organization that funds you to provide them with the ability to make better decisions. So none of this could have been possible without funding to seed scientific projects. And that's why I'm always pestering countries to meet their payments and give the II more money, since I have representatives here. That's another pitch. <laughs> It is a collaborative multinational approach to identifying research anchored in national needs. And you have to understand that in a multilateral process, countries are sovereign. That is a key element to understanding national uh, actions within a multilateral context. And there's no way they're going to, res they're going to surrender that sovereignty. We need party involvement through its scientific community. But most important of all, and I want to emphasize this, our projects are always interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary because no one discipline can find the solutions to very complex problems. It's impossible. It is absolutely impossible. But transdisciplinarity is incredibly difficult. Right? You have to put a lot of what you learned in your disciplines in the background and try to see things through different eyes and use different methodologies. But the fact that FAPEST, University of Sao Paulo, and many other universities are buying into this methodology, I think is wonderful. I, I, I think a reductionist approach to problem solving simply does not work to the complexity of the problems that we're solving today. And I think the Americas offer a unique opportunity for supporting this type of projects. The Americas are very homogeneous, unlike other regions. Africa, for example, which is an incredibly heterogeneous continent. The number of languages, the, uh, the number of ethnicities, uh, even the number of countries. I think Africa has 54 versus 33 countries in the Americas. Now, Asia, for example. It's easier to implement these types of collaborative projects in the Americas and use the templates for other regions. And the II has been encouraged to reach out to other regions in an attempt for the lessons learned that we have in the establishment of networks, in the establishment of the, the science to policy interface, perhaps for other regions could make use of what we know and maybe we can draw some of the expertise that we're lacking here. It has an incredibly well-established network of peers. A few researchers have come up to me saying, hi, Marcus, I, I, I hear you're the new director. I'm part of the II. I am one of the investigators in a CRN project. 
Uh, we have achieved this, 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 and this. We are wrapping up CRN3, and you'll receive the results. I'm very pleased by this type of feedback from our researchers in the room. And as a region, I think it has been exceptionally successful in the articulation of its needs in the involvement of scientists in the international forum. I, I would hope that a researcher takes an interest in the II as a subject of scientific inquiry onto itself. Why has the II been able to do this? I think there's a number of uh, possibilities for research, uh, I would say, from someone interested in the multilateral science uh, process. So in summaries, we have the will and the expertise, but we can go much further. Right? We can go much further jointly with other regions. If you overcome challenges and build opportunities for multinational collaboration. Again, it has to be multinational, transdisciplinary, and meet national needs within an international context. You need to strengthen linkages to global frameworks. Listen, if somebody tells you that science should be policy free, should be politics free, they're hallucinating. All science has an agenda. And those that negate that it has an agenda, no, I'm just doing something. Maybe if you're a mathematician somewhere, you, know, you, can, you can find a new formula devoid of political pressure and so on. But there's a lot of policy pressure on scientists. This can be negative and it can be positive. And this is the type of environment you'll be navigating in. But we have to be sensitive to the global frameworks to be able to leverage better funding. Countries are going to have difficulties in achieving the targets under the Sustainable Development Goals. There's a number of lack of data, lack of capacity, right? overriding problems. It's, it's, it's not going to be easy to achieve those goals. And I think this is the role that you have to consider. And I think this only needs your support. You are in an incredibly opportune moment right now. The challenges that face the global community at times appear intractable, but they're not. Right? There are solutions to these problems. And you're in a position as a young researcher where you're probably at your peak right now. Your doctorate will probably be the best piece of writing you'll ever do in your life. You'll be guided at every step of the way. The innovations you'll think up will probably be in the next 10, 15 years. Then you'll just retire into uh, uh, you know, job security and a paper here and there. But this is your opportunity to do something innovative and try to impact the role that science can have on policymaking. Things are, well, they're touchy right now. I don't know if you saw that paper, that report that came out from the Danish Institute on traje trajectories, that if uh, we go past or even up to the two degree, uh, we may not be able to bounce back because a certain feedback loop occurs. You know, that frightened me. That, that, uh, you know, oh, there's still time. The next 20 years is when policy has to be made. But that report, that scientific report, scared me because it seemed solid enough. The argumentation was solid. And this is the type of work that we require to provide policymakers with their decision making. I'm here today and part of tomorrow, I believe. So if you have any questions, have any questions, the II, we have our website, come and look at it. And I do hope that someday you'll be part of our CRN projects. Thank you. Hello, I don't know if you have any questions before we start next session. Okay. Uh, you first. Yeah, I'm sorry. You need a, the microphone, I can sit there. This is the effect of the coffee. <laughs> huh? yeah. uh, hello, good morning. Hi. Uh, 
So actually, this question is uh, not only uh, like I was, I'm not only asking this from you. Actually, this is uh, for uh, Professor Herman as well. I don't know whether he's available. I don't know. Anyway, uh, so I'm just curious uh, of your uh, level of success in collaborating with uh, developing countries, mainly uh, Asian and uh, in African region, in promoting science. The IAI has had very little collaboration with African and Asian countries. And this is something that we are trying to change uh, radically. And in fact, there is a similar organization to the IAI in Asia called the Asia Pacific Network. I don't know if you're from India or Pakistan. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. I believe Sri Lanka is a member of APN. Yeah. And uh, I attended their meeting uh, uh, two months ago or a month ago. And we decided to try to see where uh, certain cooperation, exchange of information could be mutually supportive uh, and um, uh, support our projects. Also, the new president of our executive committee has encouraged me very much to reach out to Africa because so many of the problems in Latin America, particularly Brazil and so on, seem to parallel some of the development uh, or some of the environmental issues that you find in Africa, food security, alleviation of poverty, and so on and so on. So there is quite a bit of room for collaboration, but historically, no, the IAI has not reached out to Africa and Asia. Well, there's, there's two issues here. First of all, to implement a formal program, I would probably need to go ahead from my conference of the parties. There would have to be a formal decision asking me to implement a program to do XXX with region A, B, and C. Informally, I think there's a number of avenues that you could explore. Uh, my favorite, as my favorite economics professor used to say, Marcus, given enough money and time, anything's possible. So if, I don't know, $2 million appears from the sky for me to do a project with Africa, I am absolutely sure my parties would not complain as long as American parties are involved in the project. And the best a avenues for that would be organizations such as the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation, perhaps the BRICS and the new development bank they're setting up. Uh, I know China has a new development bank that we are, have our eyes on. So there's a number of other possible pathways. So yes, we would be ready given you know, uh, sufficient funding and given a formal go ahead from our parties, we'd start immediately. Uh, actually, uh, actually, I have two questions. Uh, I would like to know how to provide in res uh, results and data in Brazil uh, when the government is making so many cuts in some in the budget of science and research. And do you think it's possible to make uh, high quality science in on international level? with uh, so low budget in research and science? Um, I can't comment on Brazilian national policy. regard. That would be inappropriate for me to do so. There's many Brazilian researchers here and many government representatives, and perhaps they would prefer to take that question on. Uh, all I can say, if, if Brazil comes up to me, all I can say is, listen, you have a number you know, of obligations. I don't know. I, I hope you're doing well with them. But that's, that's where my, now privately, you know, over a coffee and dinner and so on, I, <laughs> I could say, hey, you know, we have this issue. And this is part of my job to, if a country is not respecting 
a multilateral agreement, I would probably very diplomatically mention to the party that you know perhaps they may wish to reconsider a certain policy. But again, this is a total sovereign decision and highly inappropriate for me to comment in public. It's a sovereign national decision in countries set their own policies. Now, with regard to funding, um, again, good science is based on funding. That's why FAPESP, you know, and, I'll, and being Brazilian, I, I I think I can be undiplomatic about this. FAPESP is basically propping up science in Brazil. If it weren't for FAPESP, I think our science, I don't know, we wouldn't reach the levels we're reaching right now. And I think their model is a very good model. Um, and it's very difficult to undertake good, innovative science with little funding. Even more, a lot of science has negative results. Right? You learn from mistakes. You learn from not achieving the correlations you thought you achieved. And that takes time, that takes money, that takes support. And my answer, my very simple answer to you is it's very difficult to do good science without you know, support and financial support. Marcus, hmm. we have time for more two very brief questions. And I ask you to say your name and country. Yeah, hello, I'm Quizzy. I'm originally from Ghana. I study at the University of Cape Town. Yeah, so I wanted to know how I has uh, actually addressed the issue of the certainty of the science uh, with policymakers. I know that is a challenge, has been a challenge for IPCC on the science. They give, you know, the policymakers want to say uh, the temperature is going to rise by maybe 1.5 degree, and then they're going to be writing stuff about it. Uh, whereas the science will say, okay, we can give you a range between 1.5 and 2.5 degree. So how has I addressed that issue? Thank you. That's an incredibly difficult um, uh, and the, the question, and then you answer both. Both, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nancy from Kenya. I'm from Addis Ababa University. Um, my question is uh, about the challenges. Uh, you've talked about weak scientific institutions, and you find that in most developing countries, we've done a lot of research, like in Kenya. I come from Kenya. A lot of research has been done, but they have never reached to the policy level. And we are still using the APA and the American policies, which do not apply to us because we have different environmental conditions. Mm -hmm. So what have you done to uh, encounter the issue of the weak scientific institutions to make your research successful to reach the policy level? Thank okay. you. Thank you. I'll, I'll try to answer as quickly as I can. For the time. Okay. You're absolutely right. It's extremely difficult to convince policymakers with the type of language that we use. The correlations may indicate, the data suggests, these are the options, but we don't know what's really going to happen because, well, we have this factor that might come in and this. You're right. It's, it's, however, I think scientists can reach a chord that given option A, this, there's a strong probability that this will occur. I think this is what IPCC is about. When you look at the negotiations, reaching a report, reaching the conclusions of the report, there has to be a certain degree of authority in the data that reflects a certain trend. And I think policymakers are very sensitive to this. And policymakers aren't stupid. You, you know, people always complain, ah, oh, there's the science, why don't I make this? You, you have to understand the pressure that policymakers have to make a decision, right? Closing a factory, well, you can destroy the jobs, although the results 20 years from now may be very positive. Uh, fishing less may impact on uh, the food security of your country. So there's a number of issues that, that come to the fore. But you're absolutely right. But I do think that once you reach a certain level of validity in the data, that certain trends are identified I think there is almost, you know, um, you know, just between you and me, there's very little question that climate change is occurring, although we have, you know, climate and, uh, you know, agnostic people that don't, that don't seem to, but I think the, even, even them say, no, climate change is occurring, it's not just industry and, you know, human um, actions. I, I think as long as you have strong accord in your networks, 
you have scientific support for a vision and the data strongly supports your correlations, I think policymakers can be convinced. As, a, as concerning weak institutions, I think this school is an attempt to strengthen institutions at the national level. The fact that you're participating, uh, you're from Africa, and uh, you're aware of the problems, you're going to back home, you're going to say, look at the FAPES model, maybe this, you'll have a certain degree of authority in your voice because of your education and position that you may hold, and step by step, we build stronger capacities. I think the II has tried to do this, at least in Latin America, through workshops, through science policy uh, meetings, through integration of our scientists in the IPCC uh, reports and so on and so on. But it is, the, it is um, I think the scientific community does have a responsibility in this, and this shouldn't just fall into the shoulders of the government. You do have a responsibility to speak out, to participate in the policy process, and try to make your, your views known. I worked many years in Kenya. I, I know the issues of your country. I admire it very much. I have great love for that country, and I understand very well what you mean by your institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. And, and now, uh, I think this, some of these questions will be dependent. Uh, in, the, in the panel, we are going to have right now conducted by Marcos, and then I give you back the mic so that you'll be able to lead the, the panel. Yes, <laughs> it's the coffee. Uh, thank you, you're not through with me yet. Um, we now have a panel on the importance of oceans and the need of scientific knowledge for decision making. Perhaps the questions that you've asked can be amplified. Um, I would like to invite the panelists up first. Uh, the Vice Minister of Environment from the Ministry of Environment and Natural Resources, uh, Dr. Angel Ibaja from El Salvador. Uh, Dr. Angel Ibaja Kursios is a doctor in medicine, a post uh, degree in public health, master's in environmental and natural resources. He also served as an academic research essay essayist, university professor, environmental activist, alter mundist, and the former rector of the Salvadorian Lutheran University. Former president of the Salvadorian Ecological Unit, guest professor of the Master of Environmental Risk Management in Central America, and uh, teacher of the Master's International Relations and Environmental Management at the University of El Salvador. And he's also a member of the Latin American Network of Political Ecology and the editorial board of the ILE magazine of Cuba. It's, it's, it's very interesting to have a doctor. Uh, I always feel safer with a doctor next to me. I'd also like to invite a colleague and also one of my directors. Uh, he's the focal point for DII from Argentina. He has a Bachelor in International Relations from the University of Belgrano and a Master's in Diplomacy at the Brazilian Diplomatic Academy, the Rio Branco Institute. Those of you that are not Brazilian, the Rio Branco Institute is considered one of the best diplomacy schools uh, in the world, I would say. Uh, since 1999, he has worked in the Foreign Service of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Argentina, serving in Argentina representations and abroad in many branches of the government. He was a professor of history of international relations of Latin America, very well suited for this talk, at the University of El Salvador, and professor of theory of international relations at the Catholic University of Salta. My next guest is uh, Mr. Andre Paul Jack from Brazil. He is the general coordinator of oceans, Antarctica, and geosciences at the Ministry of Science, Technologies, Innovations, and Communications of Brazil. He's the general coordinator of this ministry, of this uh, uh, unit in the ministry. He has worked in marine and Antarctic sciences for more than a decade. Biologist with a master's in ecology from the University of Brasilia, he coordinates the Brazilian research endeavors in the Atlantic and Antarctica, providing technical advice on governance actions, analysis of research projects, the formulation and implementation of public policies, and this is quite interesting. Here we can, as a scientist, you can ask him how the 
Well, he reaches his policies. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but I will. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Setley and international cooperation, managing the budget, which is a nightmare, among other activities. As a fellow from the United Nations Nippon Foundation of Japan, he undertook research on a policy framework for ocean science coordination in Brazil. Very appropriate for this uh, board. Focusing on science policy interfacing the decision making process. He also acted as the global alumni representative from 2012, coordinating alumni activities among more than 50 countries. He has experience in the non-governmental organization sector and having acted as a project coordinator in the direction of the NGO PECI on research and conservation for the Cejado biome. A friend, uh, Salvatore, who we've known each other for almost well, I don't want to say how many years because it's depressing. <laughs> he is, the first thing he said to me is, boy, we used to have darker hair. He is the science officer of the Intergovernmental Oceanic, Ocean, Oceanographic Commission of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural, UNESCO. Um, he is the head of the ocean science section at uh, IOC of UNESCO since 2017. He used to be head of biodiversity in UNESCO, which is also quite interesting. Has served the executive secretary of the UN Secretary General Scientific Advisory Board, senior program specialist for scientific assessments, uh, chief of the Jakarta Mandate on Marine and Coastal Biodiversity at the Convention on Biological Diversity, a social associate expert at the IOC, lecturer of an European Commission, uh, project on environmental ap impact, and so on. And so I won't continue because we won't finish, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's his multilateral experience is quite interesting as an international civil servant. And with these words, I would like to invite Dr. Angel Ibarra to say a few words when you're thinking. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Voy a hablar en español. Eh, primero que todo, quisiera agradecer al Instituto, a la Universidad de San Pablo, por la invitación y por facilitar estar esta mañana con ustedes. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Institute, the IAI, the University of Sao Paulo, for the kind invitation um, to be here this morning. Y como decía Marcos, soy viceministro de Medio Ambiente de El Salvador, un país pequeño, centroamericano, geopolíticamente marginal, y mis opiniones, que no son las del gobierno de El Salvador, serán precisamente de un académico, de un activista, de un servidor público con visión desde el sur. Okay. As Marco has introduced me, I'm the current Vice Minister for the Environment of El Salvador, a small country in the geopolitics, and the opinions I'll make today is not uh, as Vice Minister, but in my position as citizen environmentalist. ¿Cuáles son los desafíos para la sustentabilidad y la gobernabilidad de los océanos? Primero es reconocer de qué estamos hablando. Um, Será... Sorry, yeah. The question, um, what are the major challenges for ocean sustainability and governance? First is to recognize what we are talking about. Será que la crisis oceánica que se expresa por la desidificación la contaminación marina, la destrucción de los hábitats, es una crisis aislada, es una crisis particular, o será que es expresión de una crisis global a la cual nos enfrentamos hoy esta humanidad. Um, so, uh, there are many challenges that we are facing: oceanic acidification, uh, coastal uh, contamination, destruction of habitats. Uh, and the question is, are those uh, isolated uh, crisis issues or are they part of a global crisis that we have to face today? Nosotros reconocemos que se trata de una crisis sistémica, que algunos llaman también una crisis civilizatoria, que es producto 
del acelerado metabolismo social de la humanidad inequitativo que ha sobrepasado ya los límites de la biocapacidad del planeta. Uh, we think it's an a system, systemic crisis due to the result of a human crisis, the result of some practices that uh, we have to address today. Y como servidor público, mi enfoque es, es político, y en tanto política, ciencia y sustentabilidad tampoco son indivisibles. Muchas de las cuestiones que han determinado o los elementos esenciales que han determinado la, haber sobrepasado la biocapacidad del planeta han sido decisiones políticas en favor de intereses políticos y económicos, hegemónicos, en, principalmente en los últimos siglos de la humanidad. As a public servant, um, I need to focus on political and uh, scientific issues. Um, And I think we have to take into account some key elements, considering the um, excess of the overcapacity that humankind have uh, uh, gone access to how the earth can sustain. Y que precisamente no respetan el rigor científico, no respetan el conocimiento científico, sino que lo utilizan en función de sus intereses. Ese es uno de los problemas centrales que estamos padeciendo en este periodo. And one of the problems that I see is that many of the uh, policy makers may not take into account the scientific results and may use that in wrong ways. And that's one of the things and the challenges that we are facing today. Marcos habló, y los compañeros que me antecedieron, de las negociaciones internacionales en relación con el clima, en relación con la biodiversidad, y cómo se logró la Agenda 2030 de los Objetivos del Desarrollo Sostenible. Uh, Marcos, is, Marcos and other speakers earlier today spoke about how international negotiations were able to reach agreements uh, on climate, biodiversity, and uh, the Sustainable Development Goals 2030. Y al plantearnos cómo abordar eficazmente estos desafíos de los que estoy hablando, tienen que ver con eso. Se han logrado porque hay escenarios multilaterales donde todos participamos. Y quizás no de la mejor manera, quizás no con el desarrollo de las plenas capacidades, pero mantener el multilateralismo como forma de relación hegemónica en el planeta es hoy por hoy una precondición para la sustentabilidad y una precondición para la gobernabilidad democrática del océano. Um, how to address those challenges and that are multinational, uh, where I think it's very important that we all can participate uh, in these discussions to take into account the homogeneity of all the countries, our preconditions for sustainability and governance. Pero a pesar de haber logrado la Convención Marco de Cambio Climático y en el diciembre del 2015 el Acuerdo de París, ustedes conocen quizás mejor que yo cuáles son los grandes límites que estos acuerdos tienen y los grandes obstáculos que enfrentan para implementarse de una manera adecuada en función del futuro de nuestros pueblos. And although we have reached um, the agreement, the Paris Agreement 2015, um, we are aware that there are still many limits and barriers that we have to overcome. Debemos aprovechar de una manera creativa, de una manera entusiasta, los espacios del multilateralismo. Los acuerdos, la Convención Marco de Cambio Climático, el Acuerdo de París, los Objetivos del Desarrollo Sustentable, los acuerdos de la biodiversidad, de la agenda de Aichi, son un marco propicio para avanzar en función de la sustentabilidad de los océanos. Yeah, multilateral agreements are very useful frameworks, like the Paris Agreement, the IT Goals, the Agenda 2030, SDGs, that we can all agree and move forward in uh, targeting to reach those goals together. Pero nos debemos de hacer cargo de las amenazas. Y yo creo que para más de un centenar de jóvenes, que se ocupan de estudiar el tema del océano, también le debe de preocupar las amenazas a la paz mundial. 
no podemos hablar de gobernanza democrática del océano si se desatan conflictos regionales, incluso atómicos, no solo en el mar meridional de China, no solo en la península coreana, no solo en el estrecho de Hormuz, sino que también esa es una amenaza que está latente para toda la humanidad. Um, those challenges also need uh, to be considered by all you young students uh, in addressing those big challenges, not only in terms of ocean governance, sustainability, but also world peace, when we see in the context of many other crises arising. Y los científicos debemos preocuparnos porque nuestra ciencia no genere más concentración de la riqueza. Que nuestra ciencia no esté al servicio de la desigualdad que crece de una manera abismalmente. Y que nuestra ciencia no esté en función de falsas soluciones, ni al problema del clima, ni al problema de la sustentabilidad oceánico y marina de la cual hoy nos ocupa. Another important point is that scientists also have to worry about how to use their science to decrease inequalities and not increase it. Uh, also uh, to promote fake solutions, but that promote um, good results. Y quiero terminar porque nos pidieron que sean introducciones cortas, <laughs> que un desafío para todos nosotros y nosotras es que el océano siga siendo el más vasto e inmenso bien común de la humanidad. Que el océano no puede, no puede convertirse en un objeto de apropiación económica, de dominación política, ni de amenaza militar. And I want to finalize this initial comments um, that we have this challenge, that for all of us, oceans have a value it's a common good and it has its common global value. And Aunque somos un país pequeño y marginal, pensamos en el futuro y somos optimistas de que el futuro le pertenece a la humanidad. And although we are a small country, we value this and uh, we would like to um, contribute to these concerns and challenges. O quizás por ser marginales y pequeños es que pensamos así. Or maybe because we are small, <laughs> we think that way. Okay, gracias. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibarra. Very, very well put. And it's also interesting that being a doctor, I think you probably have sensitivity to many of the issues that environmental degradation brings to, to human welfare and human health. It's, uh, it's, uh, I'll probably try to quarrel you some more and ask you some questions later on uh, on this. I'd like to invite our next speaker. Mr. Mariano Jordan, the Director of Innovation and Cooperation in the Ministry of Science, and Technology, and Productive Innovation in Argentina. Thank you, Mariano. Thank you very much, Marcos. First of all, thank you very much for the, for the invitation to you, to your organization, to, to FAPESP, to the, to the Institute, and to the USP, which we acknowledge its role uh, uh, nationally, regionally, and globally, not just because of the previous speakers' uh, numbers and, uh, and presentations, but especially because we heard from a carioca like you, so we know it's really good, if you said it. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tackle in, in my presentation briefly five, uh, five uh, guidelines related to the challenges ahead in uh, sustainability and cooperation in marine, uh, marine issues in general, not just marine science, from the point of view of a, of a medium-sized country with a strong scientific and, and capability. But we, that, uh, in the case of Argentina, has always lived with it back to the ocean. Yes, uh, Argentina, according to different, uh, different sources, has a huge potential uh, in the seas. Up to 15% of the GDP can, can be from the ocean uh, if we do it well in the next uh, 20, 25 years. But on the other side, it has today the smallest ratio 
uh, in, in marine resources. So these five axes I'm going to tackle. The first one is um, extremely uh, spiritual and, and metaphysic, money. Uh, money is not, is not uh, uh, you know, marine science, marine cooperation uh, is not cheap. It's extremely expensive uh, because of the fact the infrastructures it, uh, it uses and it will be even uh, more expensive in the next in the next years why because to the use of of uh, marine devices to different uh, um, underwater devices it will some different other structures for example satellites uh, argentina is giving in this uh, specifically in this uh, last days has launched the SAUCOM satellite uh, with, uh, in cooperation with uh, the space agency of Italy, uh, the ASI, that will be used specifically to cooperate with, um, with, uh, with the marine issues. Not, not specifically, but it, it will be at the, um, one of its part. Uh, we, are having, we have another bilateral cooperation in, in marine and satellite uh, issues with Brazil, the Savia Mars satellite, and not just because of this, but because of the fact that money is uh, scarcer and scarcer for science in these days. I heard uh, uh, a, re uh, a question related to national scientific budget in Brazil. It can be, I, I, it would not be a surprise if my colleague from Argentina make the same question because it's, it's not, uh, it's, a, it's an issue in Argentina, it's an issue in different, in different countries. Uh, the European Union, which for many times was, was uh, uh, um, an important source of financing, even if it uh, tackled, successful, tackled successfully the 2008-2009 uh, uh, financial crisis, has made many different changes in related to the, to the use of money. And that I can do a, a, a link to some some concept that were tackled before, the the use of science, the use of science and the use of, of science in the seas, um, applied science versus uh, basic science. I can say it from being uh, coming from a country in which between three quarters and uh, between 75 and 80 percent of the national state budget uh, is dedicated to basic science. So we have a, a, a weakness, we have a weakness there, and we have to use science, and the ocean can be a source for that, to advance the, to advance our societies, Argentina, depending on the the, the national the, the sources, has 20, 25 percent of people under the line of poverty. So there's a social there's a social mission for knowledge for science to to be to to go from the specific of uh, basic science to applied science. Yes, uh, it is it is. It is a need to, to have a basic science, but it's also a need to have applied science. Um, basic science is easy, it's easy to, to, to go with. You invest in laboratories, you invest in um, fellowships, you invest and you have it. But then you have the other, the other part which is more difficult. And again, this is the responsibility of you young and present and future uh, researchers in this area because a lot of the, the research is carried out by you. It will be carried out with uh, state, national money, I mean money of all our, our cities and our fellowship. The second point is cooperation. Because of the previous point, we need to focus. We need to, 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 to go uh, better and better for the definition of the areas of working. 
and not just in national initiatives, but we have to avoid overlapping. Uh, as Marco um, showed us, we have, for example, in environment more than, you said, 1,500 uh, treaties. This also trends to happen in uh, national um, in regional and international initiatives because we finally realized that we are trying to avoid overlapping we are trying to focus our resources and finally we have three four five initiatives related global or regional or multilateral initiatives relating to the same aspect so cooperation to avoid that is important the third point is integration but um, I mean, to make a, a, a holistic, a total approach, not a reductionist one, and many areas were mentioned in the, by the previous speaker, many, many specific scientific areas, but it also was added um, cultural aspect. It was also mentioned money, obviously, but there is, there's a lot of other areas I'd like to share with you. I take some, some, some with, with me. Um, for example, defense, security, trafficking, fisheries, projection, projection to Antarctica. There's a lot of issues to be tackled in, in, in this area. Um, another of you make the question to, to literacy, popularization of science, popularization of marine science. Those are the areas to be integrated. The fourth point is science to policy with the specificity of science to diplomacy that I don't have a lot of time, I think. I'm going, it's okay? Okay, okay. Um, well, I was uh, going to, to, to leave it just with the excellent presentation Marco made, but there is uh, um, an excellent example, an excellent global example. I mean, global in the, in the, um, in the sense that applies to every coastal country. You know, according to the United Nations Conference on, on the Law of the Seas, uh, the countries had the, the, I don't know if the right or the obligation to scientifically define the marine platform. In Argentina, which as Marco made the, 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 the explanation, uh, the, this terrible overlapping in different in different areas in which two ministries are having different delegation and different point of view uh, to to a same to a same international issue well the definition of the national platform was a very good example of a very a well conducted policy scientifically uh, based in we launched we, Argentina was the um, the second country to make its presentation to the United Nations in 2006 uh, with a um, second second study uh, presented in 2009 um, the the, interfa the interface of science to diplomacy was also present because uh, you know, Argentina has certain um, limit issues with um, extra zone uh, countries in, in South Atlantic. So both both countries, Argentina and, and and the extra area country, made its presentation. Finally, the United Nations decided that it would not consider any any presentation made for uh, an area under. Uh, sovereignty dispute problem, so it was also an interface. And after, I think that uh, more than 25 uh, scientific uh, expeditions to the to the Argentinian seas, with the collaboration also of uh, Brazil and Uruguay, Argentina made its presentation. And in 2016, we received our our our. The, the United Nations made its resolution in which uh, the total space of Argentina was more than, in the seas, was more than doubled. Yes, uh, it's one, it is a, our national platform is one of, of the most important in the world in extension and also related to, to um, uh, live, uh, live and not live resources, uh, economic resources. 
So that's an excellent example, an excellent field, an excellent avenue for international cooperation. As I said, we, we had the, the cooperation of Brazil and Uruguay. We helped Uruguay uh, with the definition of their platform. Brazil helped Namibia with the definition of their platform. So there's a, an excellent avenue of South-South cooperation. And last, and I swear the last one, coordination with different stakeholders. And here I can, I think, um, you know, I, I, as Marco said, I'm, I'm, I'm a diplomat, I'm a career diplomat. Maybe um, in the, in, in the, um, in people imagination, one of the most uh, um, bureaucratic professions, it can be, it can be, it, it, it always can be, of course, but it has some, some, how can I put it, some element to add to an equally important activity, like science, which is the institutionaliz institutionalization, yes? Uh, there's a trend, there's a trend in science, it, as you have the extreme uh, centralization and the, the different states in some areas of work, diplomacy for example, you have in science uh, the contrary tendencies. As I said, for example, <coughs> uh, it's very usual to see the participation in the participation of uh, different stakeholders. Ah, which different stakeholders? Well, stakeholders from Argentina, from Brazil, from Spain, from Uruguay. And when you go to the list, they were participating in a personal basis. So, important as your, as the scientific point of view can always be, it must sometimes be inside a national, uh, a national point of view. Why? And I live with this coming back to my first point, because you have a challenge abroad, ahead, sorry, you have a challenge ahead in which you are the, the, the sparehead, the beachhead, the most important force, which is the conversion of science, in, of knowledge in wealth for our societies. Again, I came from a country with 20, 25% of people under the line of poverty, and science is very important to make uh, mankind uh, more intelligent. But it is important also to make it uh, healthier, happy, happier, and to have excellent jobs. This is the, 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 the most important challenge ahead for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mariano. I, uh, the, I find these talks fascinating because you're listening to people that are deeply involved in the science to policy uh, interface and the issues that they bring up, poverty and alleviation. He's absolutely right. For the South, poverty allevi alleviation is one of the main topics that we're concerned with. Right? We, get, it's, we cannot accept that high a percentage of people below the poverty line. So, with those words, I would like to invite our next speaker, Mr. Andre Pojek, the General Coordinator for Oceans, Antarctica, and Geosciences at the Ministry of Science, Technology, Innovations, and Communications in Brazil. Thank you, Marcos. So, is this okay? Should I come closer? Is it good? I have to swallow the thing? Okay. So, let me just, as my colleague said, just thank uh, FAPESP, EIE, USP, my friend Tuha, for inviting me here. I know this can be tricky. I know that I can be eaten up by scientists, but this is the deal. And this is very good, actually, because we have been doing this for quite some years now. And I want to post you some questions, because I, I see some people uh, dying at the back and almost sleeping over their heads. So let me just ask you once. Uh, how many of you, please raise your hands, how many of you know what UNCLOS stands for? Okay. <clears throat> UNCLOS stands for United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, okay? That is a basic document for your classes. You need to go through it. It's 
hard because of friends as Mariano, diplomats have written that. <laughs> it's really hard, but there is a special session on scientific research and the transfer of technology and things that are really interesting to be reading. And there is also a question of is the ocean a uh, mankind uh, thing or is it first come, first serve, you know? There are tricky questions in the convention. It took us 10 years to get that signed, ratified, come into force. It's not easy. And the convention stops where Antarctica starts, which is funny because it's the same ocean, right? But it, that's what happened. And scientists tend not to understand this kind of thing, you know? And my job is to explain to them how things are done at the political level. And my job is also to talk to my minister what the scientists are doing at the scientific level. So I have another question for you. Uh, I imagine that you all have scientific background, right? So among you, who ever thought about becoming a bureaucrat by heart? <laughs> we have two hands. Love you girls. Great guys, we have some hope. Because you know why? I, I used to be a scientist in my past life. And you know what's lacking? You know what's really lacking? People that understand what scientists are saying because you can't communicate. Nobody understands what you're telling. Nobody understands anything you're doing. Not even your mothers and fathers. They don't know what they're doing. And whenever you try to explain it, it gets more and more complicated. And when you get to statistics, everybody's sleeping over. So. We need those guys among you that are wishing to take the message forward and become and getting one nature paper, two pages into one paragraph in a way that people can understand and make a decision in an elevator run. That's how things are done. You don't get to pass a bill at the Senate or the Chamber of Deputies without talking to a lot of people for a long time and explaining them. And whenever we put science in front of it, it's always good because there are two points really important about science policy interface. The first one is that scientists are always right, which is wrong, right? <laughs> and the second thing is that science is above good and evil, which is also wrong, right? <laughs> but we tend to live things like that. So we, for some times, we take full advantage of that. So whenever we want a message to go through to the right people to make the right decision, we get one of, one of those speakers that you have for this week, which are all my colleagues, because we do depend upon them. And we put that guy in front of and a lot of titles, you know, he's PhD, postdoc, blah, 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 he's the man. And then the guy comes and says exactly what you want him to say. Because then everybody will listen to him and say, wow, the guy has a point. And it's good, right? So you have strange decisions, like uh, you know that tuna is endangered, right? So, as plastic is bad for you. You know, those are the kind of messages that people tend to understand beautifully. But one thing that they tried to do, environmentalists, was to put tuna in the endangered list of species, the red list, right? Because they couldn't uh, uh, protect the tuna, the, especially the bluefin, right? Uh, through the mechanism of fisheries. So someone there remembered that tuna is also biodiversity, right? It's not just commodities. It's actually a living being. So it could be uh, uh, put into the endangered list. So you know what happened? Uh, a certain country that I'm not mentioning uh, hired high-level scientists, paid the good cash to them, so they could make it public information saying that the bluefin population was actually doing fine. And they published that paper in a very good magazine. And you know what happened? There is no tuna in the endangered list. The guy lost his career because you have to live upon the most cruel evaluation system, which is peer-to-peer. -peer. You guys are going to be evaluating yourselves. So that's really cruel. But at the same time, the guy must be today in Martinico somewhere, you know, enjoying some sunlight and with a lot of money in his bank account. But his scientific career was devastated because it took the other good scientists around an year to public, make it public the information that the paper was wrong, actually, that the populations of bluefin tuna wasn't good. But that was too late. So you do have a matter of time. You do have a matter of um, uh, 
scientific information. But you do have something very tricky, which is called the, uh, the principle of, um, uh, what's the name of that? Risk assessment and uh, precautionary approach. Precautionary approach means that you don't know and you need to do something. Sometimes you even know something, but you ignore that and you go ahead doing something, taking a decision because it's like the end of the world. So because of precautionary approach, things terrible happen, but really good things also happen because we needed to take decisions. So my question is, uh, where's the scientific information? Where is it lying? Who knows about it? So the point behind all of this and the whole week that you're going to be here studying this is actually that this is all based on people. It's not based on data, it's not based on institutions, it's not based on bills and laws. It's based on people. So you guys here, you have a very good opportunity to know each other and to get to come back with what we call an ocean mob. Because then you know people from Sri Lanka, from Kenya, from Spain, from Australia, from Brazil, Argentina, and so on and so forth. And you guys will be the future scientists dealing and informing us bureaucrats, or your colleagues that are actually thinking about becoming bureaucrats, what are the information that we need to know to do something about our future, to do something about the future, that the planet that we want to leave for our grandchildren. So you know each other from now, and please take note of your email accounts, because you're going to be extremely important in the future. <laughs> And this is happening right now. As I said, I, I, I was a fellow for a program in uh, Law of the Sea, which I recommend to you all. Check the website. It's the UN Nippon Foundation Fellowship for Law of the Sea. And that's funny because it's not signed. I was the only scientist there. That was fun. Because everybody was actually concerned about, you know, continental shelf delimitation, boundaries delimitation. A lot of countries don't have boundaries until today. You know, in Brazil and Argentina, our neighbors are so fun, so we had no problems with that. But you go to Trinidad and Tobago in Venezuela, oh my God. It's like they are easy clashes in, in so many different ways. It's so complicated to define. So we were, we are uh, 10 people batches per year. So it's 10 people from all over the world. And we get to know each other. And the Nippon is so f nice and kind to us that they pay for us to have meetings regularly, so we get to know each other. And we are over 100 now. And those guys, those guys are sitting at the UN, are sitting at the IOC, are sitting at the UNESCO, CBD, and fisheries, and, na -na -na -na, and we exchange information. Because we know what's going on. You know how I, how I found out that uh, lionfish, uh, is there anyone from the Caribbean? No, no one from the Caribbean? Oh, nice. So you heard about lionfish, right? Lionfish is an invasive species that's becoming a real problem, uh, as sargassum, but uh, uh, for, for the Caribbean. So lionfish appeared in the coast of Brazil. So I started you know, sending emails and asking my colleagues from the Caribbean, what you're doing up there? What, what's going on? What's, uh, what were the decisions that you made about this? And that was extremely helpful for us in being informed in getting to know scientific groups that are research groups that are working in the Caribbean that are not at all in touch with their governments or not in touch with other scientific groups that may be in Brazil. So linking you guys is the most precious thing you're going to get from here. And listening to the speakers because we are always right, okay? <laughs> So that's, uh, uh, we know the challenges. Uh, we know that people uh, usually ignore the oceans. I still try to understand why, but uh, sometimes I do because it's so complicated. So UNCLOS, that now everybody knows, is doing a process right now uh, that also took t 10 years to be decided to take the process about BB&J. How many of you heard about BB&J? Okay, I have a few hands. All right, so. BB&J stands for Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction because you know what? UNCLOS didn't regulate about the water column like more than half of our planet. It regulated about the seafloor 
and everything that's there, so that's okay. It was one of the triggers of the convention at first. But the water column and its richness and its living beings are all there. So there are some countries that understand that that's for the whole humanity. There are other countries that understand that no, that's for whoever wants to get there. Many of us don't have the facilities or the infrastructure to explore it properly, not even sustainably, but some have. So the key message in this whole negotiation about the biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction and access uh, to genetic resources as well is really intriguing because for me, that's a living arena for the science policy interface. You can actually see that happening right there. And you can see it happening because many delegations are taking scientists to the negotiations. And that's fun to see the scientists, you guys, sitting for the very first time at the UN, having, you know, like Brazil in a plate and putting it up and trying to make a speech and then everybody just cut you off. It's awesome. <laughs> so you guys need to spend some time in our office to understand what we do on a daily basis, as we have done some time in the labs. So I understand what you guys are doing. So there is a, a need for an exchange between guys like technocrats, the middle-level guys like we are, and the scientists at the end of the chain. We need to interact more. And whenever we, f we finish this whole beautiful cooperation agreement, na -na 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 -na, we always think about you guys. So the fellowships are for you. The travelings are for you. You need to interact with your peers, etc. So now, what I'm being, I've been promoting for Brazil is we're going to be having scientists, students, great. We also need technicians, the guys that plug and play. And we also need the technocrats. We need capacity building for those guys. We need those guys to understand what you are talking about. And we need you to understand what we are talking about. And as long as we don't communicate, this is going to be always like this. You're going to be publishing papers. We are going to be reading it and extracting the main information out of that. And that's not good enough nowadays. Nowadays, we need to interact. I need to call you and say, man, what's the problem with this? Oh, this is the problem. We need to attack by this front. And then we're going to be together trying to do something best. And that's the challenge. So that's my key message to you. Exchange emails. You're going to be knowing each other for the next 50 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. It's fascinating. I was at the discussions of the blue tuna, blue fin tuna, and uh, your points are very well taken. I would like to invite next Mr. Salvadoria Risco from UNESCO, the science officer at the International Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission at UNESCO. Salvatore. Thank you, Marcos, and uh, well, this is going to be quite challenging. I'm standing between you. Uh, the excellent uh, uh, speakers before me, and, uh, and 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 lunch basically. So, <laughs> so I, I I hope I'll be I'll be up to the challenge. And by, by the way, I'm an oceanographer by by training and a bureaucrat by choice. So uh, <laughs> my first point uh, I, I'd like to make four points. My first point is about the challenges uh, before. Uh, uh, before us when uh, looking at uh, this uh, socio-ecological system that we call the world ocean. As uh, Professor Tura rightly put it uh, this uh, morning. So on the one hand we are quite clear about those multiple stressors that uh, the world ocean is subject to and I'm sure that uh, uh, many of you work on you know issues such as uh, deoxygenation, ocean acidification, plastics, uh, harmful algal blooms, the loss of uh, blue carbon ecosystems. But indeed, it's a, it is a socio-ecological system because we have users and uh, we have multiple users with multiple aspirations and expectations. So how do you put the two together while ensuring food security and sustainability? 
Now, if you look at uh, the sustainable development goals that uh, we spoke about, uh, they provide a very strong, clear, strong policy enabling framework for the kind of work that you will be doing, both in terms of uh, those of you who will become ocean scientists, but also those of you who will uh, decide to invest on uh, the science policy interface. Uh, and in fact, uh, it may sound like uh, those uh, you know, high-level objectives, uh, the sustainable development goals are far from science, but that's not true, because if you look at uh, each of the targets, and more specifically each of the indicators, for example, the one on ocean acidification, there is a methodology that is required, there is a system for data collection that is required for reporting progress. So I think the science policy interface is happening, and yet we are faced, we continue being faced with a number of emerging or unresolved challenges on the, uh, say, environmental side of things, with a number of, uh, uh, you know, increasing uh, aspirations and expectations on the side of multiple users. So those are, to me, the challenges. That was my first point. Second point is uh, on um, the most uh, uh, pressing uh, theme uh, uh, issue or issues on the, on, on, the, on the policy side of things. I would say that ocean health is probably the most pressing topic, the most pressing goal, because uh, a properly functioning ocean is going to help us address those challenges, both in terms of multiple stressors as well as multiple uh, um, <coughs> stakeholders, the aspirations of multiple stakeholders. I'll give you an example. We know that uh, the, the word ocean absorbs up to 97% of the uh, excess uh, heat and 27, 28% of CO2 emissions are uh, human induced. So we have the obligation from a societal perspective to maintain a, you know, a properly functioning ocean uh, also, when it looks, uh, uh, when you look at it from the point of view of food security, now, how to sort of uh, uh, integrate, uh, let's say, those uh, you know uh, scientific uh, uh, challenges and uh, uh, with the societal priorities. Um, so this uh, continuum uh, that goes all the way from science to policy uh, pretty much did not exist uh, when I started. I consider myself a, uh, you know, as a creature of uh, Rio uh, back in 92, uh, and, uh, and this science policy interface did not uh, really exist. Um, and nowadays, we do have this continuum in place which goes all the way from research uh, to observations, uh, data collection, uh, data analysis, modeling, uh, assessing uh, scientific knowledge, uh, the work of IPBS, IPCC, and finally, uh, you know, uh, sort of bringing the findings of scientific research to bear the needs of policymakers. And not only that, uh, uh, does exist, and on top of that, it has been tested uh, successfully, that approach. But on top of that, nowadays we also co talk about co-design. So uh, stakeholders uh, who are not scientists, and by the way, scientists are one particular stakeholder group, they are invited to join the, you know, the science table and to express their sort of uh, needs, and therefore, Although research will continue being designed by scientists, it is important that research questions also reflect the, uh, the needs of society at large. So um, probably in terms of uh, how this science policy interface should continue evolving, uh, there are a couple of challenges uh, before us. One is uh, to demonstrate the contribution of ocean science uh, to ocean economy in a systematic way. Uh, during uh, the 80s, uh, NASA uh, in the US was facing a, you know, a, a major problem, that is that uh, uh, users, uh, common people, did not quite understand uh, what that uh, sort of very, very expensive space uh, research would bring to society. And they came up with uh, this mission uh, to planet Earth program 
um, that uh, uh, a friend, uh, Bob Watson, who then became the chair of IPCC, kind of invented. And uh, it was very much about turning space technology towards the Earth so that we would better understand our own system, including uh, the impacts of the human activities. And I think it's very, very important that um, we demonstrate the contribution of ocean science to ocean economy, pretty much like what Professor Herman said earlier. Uh, I don't think it's uh, enough to say, oh, you know, it's kind of clear, kind of intuitive that if you invest in ocean science, then you what? You really have to demonstrate that you are going to create jobs, you are going to generate knowledge, uh, some of which uh, will, uh, some of which will enter the the R and D research and development uh, equation, and so on. Now, all of that, uh, and this is my fourth and last point, uh, c can be brought together under this umbrella of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Now, uh, this. The risk is that this could be a paper decade, uh, but uh, actual, actually the idea is to, for it to be an action-oriented and capacity-development-oriented initiative. First of all, it will be a bottom-up endeavor starting in 2021, but the design of the decade has started now, and it will last until 2030. And uh, there will be a strong regional components and um, the objectives are really about generating a better knowledge and uh, developing proper infrastructures to study the ocean and tackle with those challenges, uh, those challenges that I mentioned. Uh, there are a number of uh, research and development pri priority areas, including uh, compiling an atlas of the, of the, of the deep uh, ocean. Uh, we, we have a perfect picture of Mars, and we only know 5% of uh, the, uh, the, the bottom of the ocean. Uh, trying to come, uh, come up with uh, observing systems which are really sustainable over time with good coverage. Um, trying to understand how those multiple stressors uh, uh, interplay, interact with each other so that uh, we could better achieve ecosystem-based management. The question of data that uh, Marcos uh, spoke about eloquently earlier and also warning systems uh, uh, to save uh, lives. But probably the bottom line is really capacity development and uh, involvement, participation, and empowerment of people like yourselves. The, the, there is a report called the Global Ocean Science Report, which is pretty much the ocean science equivalent of the UNESCO Science Report, that demonstrates that uh, investments in ocean science vary uh, enormously. But uh, ocean science remains a prerogative of a, a lucky few. And, uh, and therefore, uh, we really hope with this decade to leverage uh, cooperation among countries so that capacity development can be achieved in ocean science and that all nations of the world can really uh, collectively help uh, through this decade uh, reach a, uh, a situation where our ocean will be uh, healthier, more predictable, uh, safer, and also more sustainable while providing opportunities for economy and society at large. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, in the few minutes that I have, I'm going to play, put three questions to our panelists and I'll wait for their replies. I'll ask you to be brief in your replies so we have opportunity for some questions from the floor. We have to break at one o'clock. But what I, what I would hope you take from this is that the people at the table right now next to me are policymakers. Right? And they also have very good scientific grounding. So this is your opportunity as you listen to their answers to understand how they deal with the science to policy interface. My first question to the, to the panelists is, what are the major challenges for ocean sustainability and governance? And how can we effectively address these challenges? Tony, who would like to go first? I, I, can I be subversive? <laughs> I think that we, we kind of tackled the, the, the questions, etc. And since we only have 15 minutes, 
if my fellows agree, I think that we should listen from the audience and get and get questions from the the guys, you know, because they must be thinking about things, a hundred things at the same time in their heads, including lunch. <laughs> Well, being an international civil servant, I always listen to parties, <laughs> and we will change the agenda, and I will open the floor. Well, let me just read the three questions, and then you ask whatever questions you want. The second question was, in your opinion, which is the most pressing theme in ocean policy that needs urgent attention? I think Salvatore <laughs> mentioned that. From the scientific and policy communities, and how to integrate science and policy to work on ocean issues ways to promote interdisciplinary research in integrated science for oceans. So with these words, I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, and then you. Please. Who? OK. Name and country. I'm not very diplomatic. Uh, hi, I'm Amavi from Sri Lanka. So. Uh, well, this question kind of crossed my mind while listening to uh, Mr. Andre about this uh, bluefin tuna case. So we have conventions to protect the environment, the living resources, non-living resources, as well as people. But do we have anything to protect scientists? Because, I mean, uh, th this reminds me of uh, an expression my uh, geology uh, professor used to uh, always say, God created the scientist and the devil created the colleague. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a problem. I mean, when you walk through, when you, when you uh, ladder up in your career, now this is a problem. So do we have anything to make sure that we are protected? From each other. <laughs> yes, I would say. Salvatore, please. Well, I, maybe I can get started. I just wanted to say uh, there is a 74 declaration of UNESCO on uh, the, precisely the rights and the responsibilities of uh, scientists. It was called the declaration instead of convention because uh, there was a certain nervousness on behalf of uh, some countries with regard to giving scientists a formal status. But um, so I think yes, and it got updated uh, through a, um, an inclusive consultative process very, very recently, only last year. On the other hand, I think there also a need, uh, is a need for scientists to get out of the ivory tower. I'm not talking about scientists uh, everywhere in the world, but uh, in some cases science has also uh, became become disconnected from uh, reality. So it's, you know, it, it goes in both di directions. While scientists uh, should be, I won't say protected, but uh, let's say they independent and uh, uh, autonomy and of, of thought should be indeed, uh, you know, uh, uh, maintained. Uh, on the other hand, that they, they also have to recognize uh, that they have an increasing, uh, you know, a role to play when it comes to uh, contributing to societal, addressing societal uh, challenges. Thank you. I believe you were next. Hi, uh, Rafael from Brazil. Uh, my knowledge, we have a lot of weak scientific awareness of the general public. I mean, people don't know the scientific results, they know how they can affect their lives. No. So, I wanna, for me, it's one of the biggest challenges of the future is to make people more aware about the science, right? I wanna know if this, is, this could be a strategy to improve the science voice and the politics pressure for the politicians to take better, how I say, decisions based on science because the, there is a public demand about that, right? And how the strategy of Brazil, for Andre, speci specific about this issue. Very good indeed. Well, we have been trying to do a hundred things, but one of that I, thought I find most attractive is actually involving citizens in science. So the citizenship science, have you heard of that? So there's a lot of schools, 
collecting data for science. And the kids are really involved in that. So that the next generation, the ge because you have another the generation below you, right? So the next generation will probably be more involved in science. And on the other hand, uh, uh, the science speech, it's really boring. So we need to have science communicators. So journalists are now learning how to communicate science. So there is a... Here at USP, they have a lot of good people coming out. Those are the same guys that beat us up, you know, but they are really good. They can communicate science uh, uh, in a very good way. And I don't expect scientists to be doing all of that, you know, and you can't uh, do it. It's not good for you to inform policy, do the science itself, deal with your colleagues, uh, inform with, you know, that's a lot of things and pressures on scientists. So I think that th those guys need to be doing what they do best, which is communicate. And then you just tell him, and he gets everything done. So those are the two things that we have been promoting in Brazil that I think that are really, really uh, making a change. And way, someone way in the back. Hello, uh, my name is Dragana and I'm from Serbia. Uh, you actually just answered one of my questions, <laughs> so thank you. Um, Sorry. I, was, I also wanted to add on that question, uh, asking if you think um, citizen science, uh, div divulgation and documentaries and simplifying our science speech will be enough to involve the public. This is just an additional question. So I'm taking the floor again, I'm sorry for that. Yes, I do, but it comes to a point into uh, Tom, this small cheetah in the African savanna is, has lost his brother, and oh my God, so you know, we have to be careful on that, because people t tend to think that uh, National Geographic documentaries are science, and sometimes are not, are just a beautiful story about a cheetah that lost his brother but found true love. So it's uh, kind of hard to have the balance, and I think that we are experiencing that, you know? So kids, again, are key to this, because kids love science, and kids love to do practical science. So whenever you have the chance to put a kid on those things from physics, you know, that the hair goes up, it's amazing, it's amazing how they enjoy understanding that. So if you are able to communicate to them and they are able to contribute at some point, documentaries in Discovery Channel and National Geographic tend to be more serious and tend to inform better. That's my belief. Okay, so my real question <laughs> um, is um, because I'm from a country that doesn't face the sea. So the ocean is something we people from Serbia don't care about at all, I think. I speak for myself, I love the oceans, <laughs> that's why I study it. But uh, as you previously said, people ignore the oceans. And I think most of the people in this room come from countries that face the ocean and that have coasts on the ocean. So if these people ignore the oceans, what role do we from a landlocked country have in ocean science, policy making, and this whole world. How can we contribute and how can we do anything in this world if not even countries facing the ocean care, apparently? <laughs> Who would like to tackle that? Yeah. Mariano, please. Well, I'm going to, to, to make a, a, a kind of guess, but uh, as I explained to you, I'm not, uh, I'm not a scientist. But I mentioned many areas in, in that affect the, that deriving from the seas affect different countries. In fact, one of the, the, um, one of the issues I'm, I'm trying to, to boost in Argentina is uh, um, a global policy to the seas. And for example, there's, there's a lot of areas in which coastal uh, in, in of scientific areas in which coastal um, coastal areas and not coastal areas inland areas as your country 
can be involved. And I mentioned, uh, I mentioned um, fisheries, which relies, is related to, to food security. I mentioned trafficking, different areas of trafficking from, uh, from people, from endangered species, uh, from uh, illegal substances, from firearms, uh, and those are complex, for example, I, I, I mentioned those areas which are, uh, which we call complex international crimes, and many of them affect countries um, which are with, uh, with, uh, with a face to the sea and landlocked countries and small island countries and, and many of those, I insist, those uh, international complex issues have a leg, have a, um, a part of it that uh, is, is, is carried out in, in, for example, in a landlocked country. I'm not going to mention your beautiful country, but many countries in your area, you know, that are affected by that uh, that problem. migration, migration by the seas from different areas that can and that countries your country can have a a, a, a voice a voice a, a participation in that again related to 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 literacy to popularization of of science and popularization of the seas of course. I don't know if it was exactly, but I think there's a a night for countries like yours. Oh. Just, to, just one more comment from Salvatore. Yeah, thank, thank you. Just to sort of uh, back Mariano's uh, presentation up uh, by saying, first of all, that uh, in uh, Anclos, that everyone is familiar with nowadays, uh, by now, uh, there is a chapter dealing with uh, the rights of landlocked uh, countries. But also that uh, what uh, the brave participant, participant from Serbia said also applies to a number of uh, countries that face the, the sea, the ocean, and that are not literal, because the ocean tends to be out of reach. And for that reason, I completely agree with Mariano that there is a need for ocean literacy. And I also like the way he uh, defined it, that is that it's, not, it's different from education. It's about popularization of ocean science, I would say, to start with. Thank you. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have two minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Bianca and I'm studying in Australia and I would like to ask what, we, what would be your advice, how can early career researchers better engage with policy makers since this is not a big part of our education or a part at all. Thank you. Who would like to take that? Yeah. Can she repeat the question? Yeah, could you repeat the question? Um, yes. So how can early career researchers better engage with policymakers? So what would be your advice? Would somebody like to answer that question? Uh, I, I have doctor. one. Oh, okay. La crisis es tan grave que necesitamos romper el status quo y que los jóvenes se hagan cargo del futuro de esta humanidad. The crisis, the crisis is so severe that young scientists need to break down the status quo. Y por eso hablamos de que necesitamos una gobernabilidad democrática, we incluyente. Need, we need a democratic governance that includes... Y eso depende no tanto de las instituciones, sino tanto del entusiasmo de la juventud. It doesn't depend so much on institutions, but mainly on the young people. Porque las instituciones nos están conduciendo al colapso. Because institutions are leading us to collapse. Y no se ven dentro del marco institucional esfuerzos hegemónicos que pongan el rumbo en otra dirección. And we don't see many deep changes within the institutions that may uh, change the status quo, the situation. Los avances que vienen desde la hegemonía 
son excluyentes. The advances that son we insustentables. See, the advances that we see are excluding and are, not, and are not sustainable, and they actually lead to more inequalities. Yo animaría que aprovechando esfuerzos como estos, donde hay más de 100 jóvenes, se establezcan redes que trabajen de una manera creativa y que obliguen a quienes estamos en cargos públicos a poner la ciencia en función de la vida y en función de la humanidad. I would suggest that we take advantages of uh, activities like this one where we see so many young people to uh, develop networks and those networks can put pressures on policymakers to change that status quo. Si no la agenda va a seguir cuánto tiempo tenemos de venir hablando en el marco de la convención de cambio climático y no hemos roto todavía con la dinámica que genera emisiones crecientes de dióxido de carbono en la atmósfera. If not, the agendas will keep the same for how many years have we talked about the climate change conventions and without uh, that kind of pressure we'll continue with the same problems like CO2 emissions. Esfuerzos nacionales, esfuerzos regionales deben de promover en, man en mantener el multilateralismo, en romper con la hegemonía unipolar y crear un mundo policéntrico. Y al servicio de eso está la ciencia, particularmente la ciencia de hombres y mujeres jóvenes como ustedes. So national, regional efforts should contribute to um, lead to the science that young researchers like you can also contribute to changing that uh, status. Thank you. Uh, and then we cut. Uh, two thank more you. questions, and then it's lunchtime. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Marianne. I'm from Brazil, and I'm really uh, excited to hear from you guys. And in almost all of the speeches, I saw these promising young people and the jóvenes and, and the, the focus on us to save the world, almost. <laughs> but the thing that I learned with my three-year child is that they, we don't learn with words, we learn with examples. And here we have people from, we have representatives from El Salvador, Argentina, and Brazil that are major examples of corruption scandals. And so the money doesn't get where it should be. So I'd like to you to comment a little bit uh, uh, how you, you guys fight against it in your institutions and I think it's not, maybe it's in the list for the young scientists, for the to-do list, uh, fight the corruption, but the list is getting bigger and bigger. So how you guys, how you guys think we should face with the examples that we have from the old people? <laughs> well. No, no. First of all, I didn't say you're going to save the world. Quite the contrary. I said you have a huge responsibility. I didn't say you were going to save anything. Second one, I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not unfortunately in a position to, to speak about the, the corruption in, in any country that different from mine. I, I don't know if you can. But in the case of Argentina, the corrupt uh, politicians, the corrupt, uh, I, I don't want to say politicians because I want to take my aside a, a group of people. On the one side, you can find corrupt scientists, it was mentioned here. You can find corrupt uh, international officials, you can find corrupt diplomats, you can find corrupt everything. The point is that that people in my country, for example, they did not arrive in a UFO, arrive and, and oblige. They were us. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to make a guess. The corrupt, corruption in your country, in my country, it's not the others. It's us. Your first task, I think, your first task is to recognize that it's not you. 
it's us. And your first task is to get involved. I was, um, I had a two-year-old girl when I became a diplomat. And I also had a lot of time to spend in studies. I did not have money, but I got involved. And that goes to the previous question, how can you get involved in, uh, in government? My recommendation is networking, but not pressure, not fighting against institutions, collaborating. Because saying, it's you, old people, it's you, official, it's you, Argentinians, that does not save you, your country, and your three-year-old son from corruption and, so, and from problems in the future. Um, I'll give the floor to Dr. Ribada just for a few additional comments. No, es, es correcta la apreciación. It's correct, the appreciation. Por eso debemos de hablar de que no hay gobernabilidad democrática. For this reason we have to de say that there's no... De que no hay sustentabilidad no. del océano sin una lógica de la alteridad. So for this reason we have sin to... Sin una ciencia basada en fundamentos <laughs> éticos. <laughs> sin, una, sin una ciencia que promueva la solidaridad, la responsabilidad universal y que promueva la justicia para todos. Sin ese tipo de ética, la situación se vuelve más grave. Y no hay ciencia a quien salve a este planeta. Uh, without the ethics, it's very difficult that we can lead to governance or sustainability science, in summary. <laughs> Marcos, just a second. Yeah. And a result, the head of the mafia in Argentina, if you assess any a page today, Argentinian page, page is uh, going to, to jail. Mr. Cristina Kirchner is going to jail. Hi, my name is Paulina and I am from Mexico. And I would like just to answer the question you make, the first one about what are the main challenges that the ocean is facing. So in my humble opinion, I think the main topic is climate change. And I just put three, like the, for me. And one of those is carbon emissions, and then massive fisheries. And the three is ocean pollution, uh, like an example, heavy metals. And all these effects and everything is related with the world population, that is why for me, are the main important challenges. Thank you. Thank you very much.